Today I want to speak to you in this very first session about have they lost their minds. Several months ago, the Lord was dealing with my heart about this conference and what needed to be said in, in my portion. And this kept hitting me because, and uh, if you've got thin skin today, you just need to roll it up because uh, it's going to be pretty tight. We're not, I want you to know our speakers are not going to hold anything back from being able to say what needs to be said in truth from the Word of God. And so in thinking and listening to the spirit of what he is wanting to say through this, I kept watching as we literally are seeing uh, leaders both in the political, uh, religious, and societal grounds that are literally losing their mind. At one point they say this, and then on the other hand, uh, this comes out of their mouth. Is there a precedent for it? Is there something that's happening? Because if it can be described or seen in this world, it will be found in the Word of God. So let me, let me give you this, and here we go. I love this quote from C.S. Lewis. He said this, when the whole world is running toward the cliff, he who is running in the opposite direction appears to have lost his mind. In this prophetic scripture that I'm about to give to you, and you can open your Bibles up to 2 Timothy chapter number 3, I've taught from this passage of scripture and preached from it for years, but there is hidden prophecy that is found inside of this chapter that I want to bring to you today by the order of the Lord. So in this prophetic scripture, uh, we are witnessing even now the revealing of these prophetic events that are taking place and the actual exposing of lies and deception, uh, that would certainly be pointing like the forefinger of Almighty God to the imminent return of Jesus Christ. And some of those can be found in some of the articles that you're seeing on the wall right now. For instance, suddenly we found out that Facebook has decided that they actually did suppress the information concerning COVID-19 and ivermectin and all the other uh, abilities to be able to get people healed. I'm not going to hit every one of these, but I find it interesting that over and over again, in fact, in recent days, you have heard that there have been, uh, when the debate was taking place, that there were cats and geese and so forth that were being uh, eaten, slaughtered by immigrants that had come in, illegals that had come into the nation in Springfield, Ohio. It was debunked right in front of everybody on national TV, only to find out that later it's actually true. This is a reason why you must be spiritually connected and involved in the Word of God, because the only truth that is coming in the hour we're in is coming from the Word of God. The national media would have you believe that what they say is absolute and true, but you need to know no longer is our media system, and I don't care who it is, call it Fox 2. All they're wanting to do is influence, not inform. So it's important for us to be able to have the clarity of the Spirit of God speaking to our heart from the Word of God that is absolute truth. So what happens when leaders lose their mind? What happens when religious society and political figures and leaders lose their mind? When rulers of countries, contrary to God, start losing their mind, it manifests itself in a variety of different ways. So biblically, we should be able to have a foundation of that. And here's number one, Nebuchadnezzar lost his mind. The Bible tells us that he lost his mind to the degree that he went out, God drove him out to eat grass like an animal, like a werewolf. Isn't that interesting? God made the king reduced to an animal to eat grass for seven years. Why was that? Because he was filled with pride. He was, uh, in Daniel chapter number three, into himself to the degree that he worshiped himself and idolatry. He got so lifted up against God that he lost his mind. So when rulers become proud and they lift themselves up against God, they go mad. How about Pharaoh when he lost his mind? The Bible said his heart was hardened towards the Lord and to the people of God. And so as a result, uh, at one point, he's saying it's okay for you to go out, but don't go far. And, uh, And Moses, and thank God, and we need to take this on because whenever there was a suppression of our worship to the degree that we couldn't even have choirs during COVID for fear that somebody would spit on somebody, Uh, It shut down the country 
and churches that wanted and pastors wanted to be able to do right by their congregations and people shut it down to be able to help and and we thought we were getting the right information but obviously we weren't we've been lied to by that pharaoh was in the same shape and so god had to persuade him through the 10 plagues that came along and when he finally said i can't take it anymore y'all can get out of here in exodus 12 but before he left, they left the country, he changed his mind again and pursued them to kill him. So this is exactly the same spirit that you're seeing rise up right now in the attackers and terrorists of the very people of God, but also Christian persecution around the world. In his madness, Pharaoh was responsible for destroying not only his country, his army, but himself because they were all drowned there and he was an agnostic himself. So. Uh, he was all about inflicting pain and he had no reverence or respect for God. Are we seeing that today? Ladies and gentlemen, we're seeing it on every level. And here's what I'm saying to you. The Bible is very clear. If you want to be able to understand what a person is actually thinking, not what they say out of their mouth, but what they're actually thinking, who they really are, the Bible says you check that by the fruit they bear not by what they look like on the outside, not by what they say with their mouth, uh, not even uh, by the policies they say, but what is the fruit? What is the results of what they do? You can get clarity on that. How about Saul when he lost his mind? Saul, when he lost his mind, it was because of an evil spirit injected into his life. Only David in his songs that came worshiping God would bring peace, but it was only momentary to the degree that he was willing to chunk a spear uh, at David and would have killed him, the Bible says. He was capable of doing that. He was of the tribe of Benjamin. They could split the hair uh, uh, of a person's head with great accuracy. The Spirit of God protected David and Saul lost his mind. He got into such madness in his mind that he killed his own son, tried to kill David. And then he rose up and killed 85 priests, according to the first Samuel 22, priests of the Lord. Consider the maniac of Gadara that's not on the wall. The maniac of Gadara, when Jesus arrived there, was cutting himself and running from place to place, having lost his mind. But when Jesus came, he set it straight, commanded the demons to come out of the man, and the Bible lets us know very clearly that he sat up and in his right mind and was ready to serve the Lord. So after looking at these cases in the Bible, it's very clear that some of our political, societal, and religious leaders have made the godless decisions that they've made, for instance, same-sex marriage, and on and on the list goes, and have lost their minds. The Bible says in the last days that men's hearts would fail them for fear for looking upon those things that are coming uh, on the land. You need to know that the opposite of faith is not fear. The opposite of faith is sight. The Bible says we walk by faith, not by sight. So whenever our eyes are deceiving us and our ears are deceiving us from what we hear, what we see, it attacks our faith as a believer. But the Bible says in 2 Timothy 1 and 7, God has not given us the spirit of fear, but power, love, and a what? A sound mind. I don't know about you, but I thank God for a sound mind, don't you? I said, I thank God for a sound mind. I got up myself this morning. I, I brushed my own teeth. I drove my own car. I walked in this building because the Lord has given me a sound mind. You better keep your mind in the time that we're in. Now to the scripture. Look at 2 Timothy chapter number three. For the Bible says it like this. This all, know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own self, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parent, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. So that sets the scene of the last days that Paul is writing to Timothy. We are there right now. I've been raised in this, born again at nine years old, raised, my dad was a preacher and all of that, and I thought to myself, boy, I'll never see the day when it gets like this. But behold, we are here right now. And for that reason, if you will, uh, for just a moment, I wanna just bring this to you in a little different version because sometimes when you hear King James, it's easy to pass it over. 
But I want to bring this to you in this reading in just a little different version. So listen carefully. Men will be self-focused, self-centered, self-absorbed, self-consumed in love with themselves more than anyone else. This is verse two. And as a result of that self-love, they will be driven to obtain more and more. These boasters are so committed to their own agenda that they will be willing to exaggerate, listen carefully, exaggerate, overstate the facts, stretch the truth, embellish the story, and even lie if it will get them into position, advantage, or the goal they desire. They are arrogant, haughty, uh, snooty, insolent. Their disdain, mocking, slandering, and speak ill of anyone that stands in the way of their ideology and freely use foul language. In this climate, parents will no longer be able to persuade, control, lead, or exercise authority over their own children. And although people were once thankful and appreciative, they will generally become void of gratitude and will be unappreciative of everything. Impurity will seep into, com- into the society and cause it to become impure, ill-mannered, unclean, uh, coarse, offensive, crude, lewd, and rude. But I want to drop down to verse number four. Uh, let's get three. Love for and commitment to family will be degenerating. Divorce will become epidemic. With irre- irreconcilable differences being the major factor of tearing families apart. In fact, every imaginable type of covenant will be regularly violated and the court system will be overwhelmed as people go overboard suing and being sued. Are you all with me out there? People will be generally losing the ability to say no and will be unable to control their instincts in nearly every area of life. People will become savage and it will eventually feel like there are no laws to protect the innocent. I am reading the top page. Here's verse four. People will walk away from commitments easily and throw away relationships. They will become reckless and impulsive and, and, uh, and look for a violent behavior. They will become full of pride, inflated sense of their own importance. They will become fixated on the unobtainable pursuit of happiness and pleasure even more than the love of God. Here's what I want to drill down on verse five. We're going to take it from here. Although they may possess an outward form of religiosity, they will rebuff, refute, refuse, reject the authentic power that goes along with genuine godliness. Here's what the admonition is. I urgently tell you to mentally, spiritually, and physically turn away and remove yourself from such people. Here's what the Bible says in chapter number three, verse five, he says, I want you to be careful because there is a group of people in the last days that will have a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof from such turn away. Having a form, an outward shape, this is what this means. They would have the right words and the right form, but they would lack the power because they deny the operation of the spirit. Like a mannequin, that stands in the window with the clothes on, looks human, has a form like a human, but is empty and void of life. That's what he's saying. The Holy Spirit is telling us that in the last days there will be whole religious groups of people that will be going in a form but lack the power. That is godlessness, the Bible says. Godlessness. It's not about the outward, friends. It's about the inward condition of our heart. And too many churches and too many pastors have become spiritual mannequins. They have become to such a degree that they go through the forms, but there is no power to save, no power to deliver, no power to set men free. And do we need to be set free? I said it many years ago that the last day spiritual involvement in the life of the church would be the deliverance ministry because so many would be broken, so many would be addicted, so many would be abused, that they needed a place that they could come where it wasn't some form, get me a little coffee and a 15 minute lecture and out the door. There must be a church that is full of the life of God and I don't care what church you come from. You may not come to Pace Assembly, but when you go to church tomorrow 
morning at whatever church you're at, you need to pray that we are not a bunch of spiritual mannequins sitting in the pew, listening to spiritual mannequin worship, hearing a spiritual mannequin pastor. It better be full of the life of God. It is critical for your eternal existence in the time we're in. Can you say amen? The Bible says that they would deny the power thereof. They literally would reject, renounce it. Paul is saying here that there's a group of people, spiritual leaders, when they are confronted with the truth. Now watch this because listen to me, it does matter where you go to church and it does matter who you're listening to. There'll be whole groups of people that would be spiritual leaders that when they are confronted with the truth, they no longer embrace it and they reject it outright. A defection from the truth of God's word is happening today to embrace the lie. The terminology that Paul uses in 2 Timothy is not a lie, it's the lie. So it is origination from Satan himself from the very first and beginning lie of all lies. And now we're seeing, ladies and gentlemen, where many denominational churches have defected from the truth that they were actually founded on. I can tell you, and our uh, Dr. Garlow will probably be able to tell you a whole lot clearer because the bottom line is, my friends, uh, I believe that the Wesley brothers will be rolling over in their grave to see what has happened to the Methodist church. Thank God our brothers behind us said we're not gonna participate in the, uh, in the confirmation of LGBT and leadership in the Methodist church and we're going global and they did just a few weeks ago. So churches and pastors uh, and church people are attempting to fit into the culture to be accepted in the world. And ladies and gentlemen, that is directly against what the Word of God says. I know we want to be like, 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 like on our social media, but my dear friends, Jesus said, they persecuted me, they're going to persecute you. If you stand for me, I can surely know where my life is at whenever people will say all manner of evil against me for Christ's sake, not for me. So all I've got to do right now is put a something out on Bible prophecy, on Prophecy Files Briefing on Tuesday, and I've got crazies from all around the world that want to log in. I mean, I just saw one late last night where somebody put a meme up there with uh, Trump on the cross telling Jesus, it's me they worship now. The, this is the minds of people that are losing their minds in the hour that we're in. And so in an attempt to water down the gospel, they present a watered down false gospel to people that has no power to deliver. In fact, it's more in line with DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Without confronting the sin nature inside of the life of mankind. Listen, my dear friends, all of us were born into sin, and in sin did our mother conceive us, the Bible says. And there's only one Savior to deliver us, and that's Jesus Christ. And what is sold today in this kind of watered-down church that Paul said you must turn away from is the idea of love and acceptance and tolerance that is creeping into the church, but it is a manipulative tool to water down the gospel because when Jesus saves us, there is a change that takes place in our life. Old things pass away and behold, all things become brand new. What does it do? It leaves the seats filled in churches with spiritual mannequins, empty and empty churches. And that's what's happening today. I was speaking to a pastor the other day talking about this because we have fed churches with what we feel like that they uh, need. And so we have customized it. We've gone out and polled the community to ask them, what do you want? If you don't like choirs, we'll take choirs away. If you don't like uh, preaching more than 15 minutes, we'll take that away. If you want coffee and bagels at the door, we'll do all that. And hey, I'm not against using the, the ability to preach the gospel, but hear what I'm telling you. When you've watered it down so much as we are watching, there are tens of thousands of churches that are closing every day across the United States and pastors that are leaving the pulpits because it's watered down to such a degree that it's nothing more than just a societal church. Ladies and gentlemen, the church in any community is supposed to be salt and light and influence. And if that community is not affected by that church, then the best thing that could happen would be for it to close down. But that's why you're here this morning. That's why we'll have 
have church here tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock because we're not here just to occupy a piece of 22 acres. We're here to be able to let salt and light come out into a dark world. So you don't counsel sin out, you repent it out. Or you could be like the Washington Cathedral and embrace anything and everything that's coming down the pike. We're told, the Bible says, to step away, turn away from this kind of a church. It is departing from the faith, it is apostasy. We're seeing this departure turn churches into nothing more than goodwill centers. We're very good at handing out water and handing out clothes and handing out food, but how about the gospel of Jesus Christ that has the power to change people? This departing from the faith is diluting the faith and is dangerous. And I want you to hear what I'm telling you. Paul says this in the writing. It is not our faith. It is not our faith. It is the Lord's faith. It is, listen, this is the Lord's Bible. This is not my Bible. It's the Lord's word. We're not to depart from it. We're not to refuse it. We're not to adapt ourselves to some and not to other. We are, the Bible says, we're to keep it. We're not to deny it. In fact, we're actually to defend the gospel of Jesus Christ. So what is he saying here? I've read this for years in verse number six and really never grasped it until I really started into this. For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with divers lusts. He's saying here in verse number six of this sort, that is those that have the form of godliness of this sort. And what happens? This spirit, this activity creeps into houses. That word creep into is described as someone who dresses in a disguise, wrapping themselves in a garment that looks like it should be, but in inwardly they're not. Creeping into houses. What creeps into our houses today? What is it that the Apostle Paul wrote hundreds of years ago that now we're seeing manifest? Well, it's not just creeping into your house, but now people can't do without it. I love technology. I love the ability that it gives us right now. We are literally live streaming this message, this conference all around the world. People can pick it up. But ladies and gentlemen, the influence that it's having right now, a few days ago, I saw a news report where a child, the parent took the phone from the child and the child went into convulsive fits. Now, I don't know about you, when I was growing up, my parents kicked me out the door at sunrise and said, don't come back until lunch. Guns? We didn't have guns. We had sticks that looked like guns. We entertained ourselves. We were in a community that entertained each, uh, each other. And on one end, my grandmother had the house of the street. On the, on the other end, my mom's best friend. There was nothing that Joey Rogers could get away with because one way or another, somebody gonna tell on somebody. Today, we allow this to entertain our children and we wonder why that they're not able to achieve, even into our own selves. The creeping into the house of technology, internet, cell phones, media communication. Daniel predicted this as a last day prophecy in Daniel 12 and four, that knowledge would increase in the last days. Well, you look at that and you say, well, that's great that knowledge increases. It is, except when it turns us away from the knowledge of God. And because we're in a non-step, uh, non-stop infiltration of information creeping into our houses, influencing us, now 47% of millennials get their political opinions from TikTok. We don't research anything anymore. Taylor Swift said she's researched it and come to her conclusion. And because of the influence that she has upon tens and thousands and hundreds of thousands of people, they'll just follow her like the proverbial Pied Piper. Now you're looking at me and say, well, I would never do that. But you need to understand this block of people that are influenced by technology and the knowledge that's rising today is taking control of the situation. And without biblical knowledge, that's what leads us right into the ditch. In fact, he says this, that these silly women, now before you want to throw something at me, all you ladies in this crowd, first of all, I didn't write it. Second of all, it's not what you think it means. 
It means that they're led captive. Now look at this because this is what's happening in our society today. They're led captive means to put the point of a spear in the back of someone and lead them where you want them to go by manipulation, mental and spiritual manipulation. Under the promise of helping us, they creep into the house with the information and he calls them silly women. Well, it's not just silly, it's this. It means a needy woman or a weak woman. It means they're offering and not just women, but those who have a great need in their life, it even goes deeper than that. He says, these women are laden with sins, loaded down, burdened because of failures, problems, disappointments in life, frustrations, their husbands are not there, the pressure that's coming upon these women is burdening them down, making these women vulnerable, and I will not say just women, but men as well, vulnerable, overwhelmed, And this causes them to become targets of Satan's manipulation, the Bible says here. Led astray with divers lust means that they're led away like an animal on the end of a rope. The Holy Spirit is warning women and men who are dealing with struggles and lust and brokenness. He's warning us that if we're not careful, we'll be taken advantage of by the technological creeping in of information that has the ability to persuade us in a direction because we're vulnerable at that moment. Verse seven says, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Ever learning, not ever able to come to the full end of it. Have you ever seen a society where people are asking, tell me this, but yet you can tell them what the truth is, but they'll look at you and say, well, yeah, I know, but. This is exactly what he's speaking of here. An endless seeking of answers, but never able to find the truth. Listening to false voices and talk shows constantly and opinions and all of that. Now, this is where I wanna dive in here and follow me closely because this is where the plane is circling Atlanta and we're getting ready to land. All of the previous verses in this chapter are leading us to the hidden prophecy found in the last days, starting in verse eight. Watch this. He says this. Now as Jannes and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith. Those who have a form of godliness now that we read about, He makes the comparison to Jannes and Jambres, who were the two leading sorcerers in Pharaoh's kingdom in Egypt in the book of Exodus that attempted to withstand and stand against the power of Moses and God Almighty. They were well known, they are well known in historical writings. So it's not just the occasion of Exodus, but they were known by multiple writers and they exposed Jannes and Jambres as being these sorcerers that withstood Moses. The words I wanna point out to you in this chapter, in this verse, resist. What did these two sorcerers do? They stood against in opposition, and it wasn't just opposition, but fiercely opposing Moses. They're corrupt in their mind. This is where we want to drill in on. Their minds being corrupted over a period of time, meaning a person whose mind has moved downward into a state of collapse. And finally arriving at a place called reprobate. In this context, this word reprobate means, watch these terminologies, unfit. You ever heard being unfit for office? unfit, disapproved, unreliable, untrustworthy. In my lifetime, I have never, and I've been a voting person for years and all that, and before everybody wants to throw a rock at me, my dad was a Democrat. And because dad was a Democrat back in the 60s, I was a Democrat. Because back in the 60s, whether you know it or not, Uh, And in the early 70s, the Democratic Party was more the conservative party to start with. Then suddenly they left me and I went Republican. This is not about political parties as much as it is a state of mind of those that are in leadership, not in just the political parties, but in the government of, of, of the United States and even around the world, a reprobate. This is the picture 
of a society that has been exposed to such negative spiritual, political, physical, emotional influence so long that he becomes compromised, impaired, and no longer trustworthy. Here's what the Bible says in Romans chapter 1, verse 28. He says this, and even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, are we there? God gave them over. I want to tell you, when God gives you up, you're in a bad place. God gave them over to a reprobate mind, an unfit mind, losing their minds to do those things which are not convenient. He goes on to say, being filled with all unrighteousness and fornication, wickedness, covetous, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignancy, whisperings, backbiters. I mean, what a list. Don't you want to spend eternity with that? This describes in this passage of scripture, a society or a person that loses all ability to make sensible, godly conclusions. The mind of a person may remain brilliant in their ideas. They might be the smartest guy in the world. But in many ways, because of their decisions, and this is the reason why you've got to prove the spirits, try the spirits to see whether of God or not. They become unfit. They don't think right. We have a little phrase over at our house that my father-in-law says, and he's here today, he says, they're just not thinking right. <laughs> We've marked that down, put it on the refrigerator, because there are some folks, look straight at me, there are some folks that just don't think right. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Amen. They can't separate good from evil, right from wrong. Come on, somebody. They'll argue with you of what the Bible says, clearly thou shall not kill, but go ahead and stamp their name on a record that says it's okay for abortions to take place. All that you've heard in misinformation, disinformation, wrong thinking, ungodly, unbiblical things that are going on, this all is steeped in this very verse of scripture right here. Even people that have grown up in the church now are becoming affected and infected. They're changing their long-held biblical beliefs and moral values. This is the result. This is what God warned us about. The endless bombardment of our minds, our soul, and our spirit every day that persuades people that says, hey, maybe I should be thinking a different way. Now, it's more than just saying, I give up. According to this chapter and this verse of scripture, Janies and Jambres and the society that represents the last day before the coming of the Lord would actually resist and oppose the truth. So Satan is using these spiritual, political, societal leaders to lead people off track, to make them reprobate. It's very important that you get a hold of this because this is where the hidden prophecy that I want to show you this morning is so valuable for us because Losing your hope is a dangerous thing. It's what Satan attacks on a constant basis. Some people say, well, I'm, I've lost my faith. In many cases, you've not lost your faith. You've lost your hope. And the Bible says very clearly that it is Satan who is attacking that hope every day. That's the reason why the, the message of the rapture of the church, the pre-tribulation rapture of the church is attacked so much. Because if he can steal the blessed hope that the book of Titus tells us about, then ladies and gentlemen, people that are hopeless begin to do things like take their own lives, walk out of church, think that it's no good anymore. But I came to tell you, there is hope on the horizon in verse number nine. But they, speaking of Jannies and Jambres and all those that take their ways in the last days, they shall proceed no further for their folly shall be manifest, that folly shall be manifest unto all men as theirs also was. What does that mean? He says, that thing shall not proceed. It means to advance or to make progress like the advancement of a disease and infection in society. 
God said through the apostle Paul to young Timothy in the last days, there's going to be that group of political, religious, societal leaders that are going to be manifesting this stuff like it is a disease and infection in society and the mental, the minds of people are going to be uh, giving up and wondering, uh, do I take another pill? Do I shoot something in my veins? But God in his prophetic word here says, their folly shall not proceed. Folly means this. It means mindless, madness, irrational thinking, brainlessness. In other words, the leaders that are losing their mind are not going to continue because of the power of God to spread the disease in society. The manifestation of that will be exposed. Look at what's been happening recently. We have watched what was supposed to be the largest amount of votes that came in, 80 plus million votes for a candidate, be removed from that location because everybody said one day everything's great and the next day suddenly he's losing his mind. Well, we saw this cognitive decline and I, I pray for our president. Did you hear what I said? I pray for our president. It's committed in the word of God for us to do that because it is not good for us. America and church for us to have a president sitting in office with the nuclear suitcase to his right, making decisions about the future when he's in a state of cognitive decline. We need godly leaders to rise up in this hour and fulfill this very passage of scripture, exposing the mindlessness. But then as believers, we're not to sit there and fold our hands. Because he goes on to say, as I come to a quick close, that Jannies and Jambres were well-known personalities in, his day, in their day, religious, social, political leaders. They came on the scene with this one purpose, to oppose the gospel, these sorcerers of Pharaoh. But he says here in the word of God, this folly just like Jannies and Jambres thought that their power was greater than God's power. I'm about to have a Pentecostal fit. They think that their power and their culmination of power is greater. So what happened when Jannies and Jambres was there? Moses shows up and said, let my people go. Come on, how many of you watched the Ten Commandments? You didn't read your Bible, but you watched the Ten Commandments. Okay, that's as good as the Bible right there. I'm talking about Moses walks in and throws his rod down. It turns into a serpent and everybody goes, ooh, and Jannies and Jambres because this is exactly what Satan is going to do. He's not, he is not the creator of anything. He is the Im imitator of everything. I want you to hear what I just said. He doesn't create the idea. He imitates the idea. In other words, God set it into motion and now Satan comes along to take God's ideas and to distort them and pervert them. So what happens? They throw theirs down on the ground, they turn into serpents and everybody's, woo. And if you're the nominal carnal Christian that comes in for coffee only at church, you're mesmerized and you go, Satan's power is as great as God's power, but you gotta keep watching the 10 commandments. Because suddenly Moses' snake, under the authority and power of God, reaches over and swallows up the serpents. What is that? It is exactly what we're talking about here, that God's power is always greater and he's going to expose the lie and the evil and then it's up to you to trust in the one who will never fail you. He said these demonic lies are gonna creep into the houses of people in the last days. You better be careful what creeps into your house. Progressive leaders will do all they can politically, socially, religiously to modify and defy the word of God, a counter gospel mingled with a, mingled with a dangerous political system. You know what that looks like? That right there. What the Bible calls the whore on the beast where the religious is riding on the power of a political system. But in the end, the mighty power of God is going to expose the faults, the Bible says. I believe if we're seeing these things right now that are manifest and the exposure of lies, then we should be looking for the mighty power of God to come. Come on, somebody. If you're seeing this manifestation of evil, you should be looking at the manifestation of the real power of God. 
I come to a close here quickly. Verse number 13 tells us this. It says, evil men will wax worse and worse in the last days. In other words, evil is going to keep on doing evil. Please don't, listen to me, please don't expect a liar to stop lying. If they're a liar, they're going to keep on, sinners sin. Cheaters cheat. The Bible says that evil men are going to keep spreading their evil disease wherever they go. And he says they're deceived and being deceived so they cannot even find their way back home. It's, that's the reason why you better be careful. People say, well, I'll just slip out of church. I won't be there. Pastor, don't worry about me. You better be careful. Because in the time we're living in, where we've already whittled down services to only usually one service a week, and most people don't read their Bibles between, I hate to say it, but it's true. If that's all you're getting per week, there's no way you can withstand the deception that's coming. But in these last days, I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask you to help me preach right here. Look at your neighbor and tell them, don't lose your mind. If they lose theirs, don't you lose yours. Thou will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed upon the Lord because he trusts in the Lord. Come on, somebody. Not because he trusts in man, not even because he trusts in preachers. We've watched preachers, pastors, and so forth fall off the map in recent months because of all kinds of things going on. Don't you elevate some man behind a pulpit to a place of authority, of God's authority. You keep Jesus in the focus of your mind. Lift up Jesus Christ. If there's a godly man or woman among you who preaches the word of God in truth and you study the word of God to know that's truth, then whatever you do, don't wonder, don't hop, don't jump, don't get unplugged, don't get unplanted. Because there is a remnant church that God is bringing together that is full of the Word of God. Did you hear me? Full of faith, full of the Holy Spirit. There are no mannequin Americans in there. Bible preaching churches, spirit filled churches, evangel uh, evangelistical churches, churches that are interested in reaching the lost, that's the kind of church you must be involved in. Hold fast to your faith, the Bible says. Why is that so important? And I conclude here. The Bible says very clearly what we should do. He said we should continue in the things that we've heard, heard and been assured of. Look at what Paul says right here. He said, from a child you've learned these things. The Holy Scriptures that makes you wise. Makes you wise, not just, not just in the Word of God, but wise in the world. Wise to what's taking place. You can identify evil and good and good and evil. But look what he says. He said, they persecuted me back in the pa in previous passage. They persecuted me. Get ready for persecution to come. It's going to happen. But all scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for you for reproof. I need reproving. Come on, somebody. I don't care who you are. You need reproving. Every once in a while, you need to be able to have that word hit you like a dart in your heart and you fall on your face and you call on God, have mercy upon me, and you get your heart right. It's good for reproof. It's good for correction. How many of you need correction? All right, all you didn't raise your hand right now, you're going to hell. Come on, somebody. I'm just saying. <laughs> I'm just saying to you, we all need correction. Pastor, you don't understand. I'm 90 years old. I don't need no correction. You know, one of the greatest evangelistic fields, and I think Pastor Shane would agree with me, the greatest evangelistic field right now are assisted living locations where they feel hopeless, nobody visits, nobody comes. It's easy to write it off, isn't it? He said, be sure that you're going to get the scripture for instruction and in righteousness. Why is that? So that you can be, so you can be thoroughly furnished all the way through your life, ready to give a defense for the gospel of Jesus Christ. How many of you want, that, want to be in that kind of a remnant church? Now, the last days are upon us, and that's the reason why you're here. You know what this entire day is about? Building your faith up, exposing the truth to you, building your faith up, so when you walk out the door, you don't keep it to yourself, but you spread it like a disease around those that are you come in contact with, so that the Lord Jesus, my prayer on the way to this service here today, God, you be glorified here today.
You expose your glory to your people so that when we walk out of here, we don't, we don't just have information, but we've got a strategy, we got a plan. We know what we're supposed to do in these last days. If that's your heart's desire, throw your right hand up in the air right now. Father, I pray for every heart that is ready to give a defense for the gospel. Every heart, Lord, that is ready to be able to stand for you in these last days, regardless of what it may be. Help us to be part of that remnant body of Christ. Would you let Dr. Jim Garlow know that he's welcome here at Pace today? Come on. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Thank you, man. Bless you. Oh, thank you. It is, a, it is an absolute delight to be here with you. I, I, before I ever came, I've known Victor Stursky, who's on your staff here. I've known him for quite some time. And so it was a joy to get to reconnect. I've got, I've got a lot of Victor Stursky stories. I'll, I'll bypass those for right now. But oh, you want to hear them? Okay, well, let's go with that. To, it, so it's a real delight to be back with this, uh, my brother. But I got to tell you, I... Pastor Joy Rogers, listen to you this morning. You, I cannot tell you how much you encourage me. A pastor who's bold and willing to stand. Yeah. Praise God for that. Yeah. Let, let, me, let me just give you the, the numbers so you have some sense of it. How, how many Protestant congregations are there in America? Probably around 320,000. COVID's wiped out some, but somewhere in that approximate range. According to Barna, how many of those are non-biblical in their teaching, uh, open, openly so. They're, they would be liberal or left-wing churches, 72%. So at least 28%. So 28% are actually biblical. 28% would actually say they're Bible teachers. Of those, how many have a distinctly biblical worldview where they apply scripture to all of life, including the governmental political? The number falls dramatically. We know in the pew the number of people the biblical worldview is around 8%. And millennials is 4%. Four out of 100 people sitting in a pew today uh, on Sunday have a biblical worldview. Could it be 15, 20,000, 30,000 churches? I hope it's 30,000. I don't know it'd be that much across America. It's a very small number. And so within the first five minutes of your pastor sharing, I just sat there praising God. Thank God for someone like this. Thank God for someone like this. Pastor, I, I pray that your influence continues to expand. And, and if, you're, if you're a part of this fellowship and you live in this community, do everything you can to get people here. Andrew Brunson, the pastor who went to prison in Turkey, he came back with a broken heart over his own condition saying, I almost did not stand. I almost cratered. It terrified him how close he came. This was a man with a PhD in New Testament studies from, I believe, Edinburgh, Scotland. And he says, I came so close to giving up my faith in prison. I barely hung on. When he realized that, it jolted him. And he came back to the American church and saw what the American church is like. And he's pleading with pastors, prepare your people. You're evangelizing, good, do that. But you, are the people in the churches in America are not ready for what they're about to go through. And they're not gonna stand. Well, what you just heard today is a part of a preparation to help you aware of what is happening, what is going through. I'm going to, uh, he mentioned in the book, Reverse. We do have, Reverse is from culturally woke to biblically awake. This is volume two of a two volume set. The first one was called Wellverse, Biblical Answers to Today's Tough Issues. And that covered 30 topics. This covers 60 of the contemporary political topics, laying the biblical foundation to them. <clears throat> the book is $27 plus a, a fee to get it here, but uh, the, we drop it down to $5 a book if you'll buy it by the case of 20 books. And the reason I drop it down, I'm obviously not making money. The reason is I'm trying to see if the Republic can possibly be saved. Now, many of you already have the book. I wanna encourage you to consider getting it to your politicians, getting it to your kids, your grandkids, your neighbors, your coworkers, buy a case of 20 if you would. We have them back there available and we drop it to $5. I've asked the Lord to help me somehow cause people to think biblically when they think in the governmental realm and to invite Jesus to go into the voting booth with them. And this is the avenue, the only avenue I know to do that right now. So buy and buy the case if you would. 
uh, if you want to just get one, they can. But I make it hard for you to, if you get just one. But I'll make it easy for you if you get a whole bunch of them. Also, I think this is the first church I've announced. As I, they, they came out recently, but I just haven't been carrying them with me. I have a few here. This is a children's coloring book that goes with this book. And is this for your kids or your grandkids? And, and this one, each, each page, like here's page 30, page 30 goes with chapter 30 of this. And so we have some of those available. It's the first time I brought them. If we run out, you can obviously get them online. I'm going to take you right quickly right now to a, a, a talk I put together recently called Israel Reveals Her Secret. It suddenly occurred to me, look what is happening. And I started making a list of these things. And I've even added, added some more even just for this occasion today. I'm going to take you on a, a, a quick walk through Israel right now of some of the things that are indicators to me. Some of them may be small things, not profoundly significant. Some are very big and very significant, but they all add up to indicate we're coming closer <clears throat> to the grand coming of our Messiah. So we're going to go for it right now. We'll start with Israel reveals her secrets, and I'm going to take you on this journey. There's a man named Tommy Waller. How many of you know the name Tommy Waller? Tommy Waller was, worked for the uh, F F FedEx, I believe it was, or UPS, I think it's FedEx, in Nashville. He had 11 children. God called him to leave Nashville and to move out in the rural areas and let the Amish farmers teach him how to farm. Not sure why, but then God called him to Israel. God called him not just to Israel, but at 40 miles approximately north of Jerusalem to Mount Gerizim. Mount Gerizim is the Mount of Blessings. Mount Ebal is the Mount of Curses that you find in the Scripture. He moved to Mount Gerizim, not exactly a totally safe place to be all the time, and called him to come there and to begin to work for the Jewish farmers for free, a planting the vines, addressing, pruning the vines, and harvesting the crops. Other people start following him, pretty soon 300, 400, 500 people coming in from countries all over the world. They'll come for a one week, two weeks, three weeks, maybe a month, and they'll stay there and work from 4 a.m. until around 2 in the afternoon for the Jewish farmers. It's become a massive movement. What they are fulfilling is the Scriptures, specifically Jeremiah 31, verses 5 and 6. And it talks about the watchman that will come. And the word for watchman, it, it prophesies 2,007 years ago that the, the, the Samaritan, Samaritan hills, and don't ever call it the West Bank, Never call it the West Bank. It's Judea and Samaria. Never call it the West Bank. That's an insult to the Scriptures. The Scripture has a name for it, Samaria and Judea. And the, the hills of Samaria would be covered again with vines. Now, I come from a rural. I live in San Diego, California. I lived there for a long time before that, Dallas, Texas. But uh, I was a farmer originally, a farm kid from Kansas. So I understand the soil. And if you don't care for the soil, you have to nurture and care for the soil wind erosion, water erosion, not following crops, uh, not rotating crops, not following properly, as the Scripture says to do, you'll deplete the soil and wear it out. The Arabs who controlled it for so long, the Arab Muslims, uh, depleted the soil. It wasn't treated well, wasn't cared for. And so maybe as much as 15 feet of topsoil is gone from Israel. And so when Israel, uh, uh, Israelites started coming back or when the Jews started coming back, they started buying up the property and at the time, it was just swamps and, and in very depleted land. You see all those rocks, it's very mixed, difficult to farm. But in the course of time, crops and, and livestock helped rejuvenate the soil. And so they, they started taking care of it and planting the vineyard. And it was prophesied at 2,700 years ago that this would happen. It's now happening all over the hills of Samaria. This is actual fulfillment. But it says the watchman will be there. And the, in the Hebrew word, that's notzerim, and that's the modern word for Christian. There's a prophecy that Christians will come and be restoring this land. If you want to get a glimpse, here's, a, here's what it looks like. I've had the privilege of being there uh, during, the, during the harvest. Here's some of the members of the family. Remember, he's got 11 kids, and many of them are now married. He's got like 50-some grandkids. And I'm trying to get my clicker to work here. It's not cooperating with me. There's another glimpse of it. Well, it's going backwards. I'm trying to hit the forward here as best I can. I'll try it again, see if we can go. In addition, in addition, 
They're bringing in cattle. It's prophesied that these will, the pastures will be restored 2,700 years ago. And now there are cowboys that come and work with the wallers and they're absolutely reestablishing cattle and, 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 and cattle manure, I don't mean to be crass, but helps rejuvenate the soil and get it back active again. This is prophesied and now it's occurring in our midst. It's one of a number of things. The second one is an unusual one. A young lady in Canada observed these spotted sheep. They were DNA tested and found out that they were from the Levant. They were from the time of Jacob, from the area where Jacob got his sheep from his father-in-law. And they were distributed around the world. She started buying them up, Jenna Lewinsky did. And she has a strong sense, she's Jewish, a strong sense of the scripture. And we've been with her a number of times over there. And she talks about in, in Jeremiah, where it says not only the people will come back, but the flocks will actually return. And so that in this end time is exactly what is occurring. Very unusual spotted sheep, DNA test. Now what they've been through in getting them back is a journey as painful as what the Jewish people themselves have been through. It's a very, very difficult what, the, what they have been through. But the spotted sheep are coming back now to Israel. I can take you to a third thing that's an indicator that something is going on here. Alongside the Dead Sea, where everything is dead, how many of you have been to Israel? Raise your hand. A number of you have been there. And you know the Dead Sea is truly dead. Nothing can live there. But it's prophesied that one of these days, Mount, Mount of Olives is going to split in two, one going north, one going south. Water will pour to the Mediterranean, Mediterranean on the west and to the east into the Dead Sea. And that Dead Sea is going to come alive. Now, as you, I've been to Israel 25 times. My wife, I so regret, my wife is always with me, but she's in New York City right now uh, for the Jerusalem prayer breakfast. She's been to Israel 76 times. And she, I went for the first time in 1981. Along the Dead Sea now is all this foliage that's coming up. Zechariah prophesies that, well, what will happen? And I think what's happening along the Dead Sea, these are pictures I took, right along the road is here's all this life all of a sudden. Here are trees. Uh, here are, there, there's, there's birds flying in. They're bringing, they're bringing fish eggs. There's fish in this. The aquifer, the, the water is already running from the Temple Mount area underneath the mount and is arriving at the Dead Sea. It, a seem, it seems to me this is a, an, an appetizer of, of what is to come, an hors d'oeuvres of what is to come. When that sea is going to come back to life, now we're seeing the, around the outskirts all this life starting to occur. Now, this is an intriguing one. This may not fit in the typical understanding of the nature of prophecy, but I'm fascinated. Having been to Israel so many times, we take a lot of people on our groups, and I'm fascinated with how consumed people are on, about shofars. Everybody wants a shofar. I have come to the conclusion, I watch, I just watch with interest and I'm buying them and learning to sound them and the hunger and desire to, to, and there's hardly any gathering I go to these days that someone isn't carrying a shofar. They're not carrying an electric guitar. They're not carrying an accordion. <laughs> they're shofars. Everybody wants a shofar. And I've come to the conclusion that God has attuned our hearts to the sound of the trump shofar. We long for that sound. We're going to hear that sound a hundred times. And on the last one, guess what's going to happen? And the hunger to hear that sound of his coming has gripped the hearts of the people. And that's why shofars are being sounded any country you go to. I've been to a lot of nations lately. Shofars are everywhere. How, how do you explain that? I want to tell the story of a guy named Robert Wenger. This is a picture of him. He lives outside of Jerusalem, a place called Beit Hogla. Beit Hogla is on the Jordan, a very, very desolate area, or certainly was, right at the headwaters where the water comes in from the Jordan River into the Dead Sea. And it's, it's the place where Elijah, uh, the mantle fell from Elijah to Elisha. It's the place where Jesus was actually baptized in the Jordan. When you go over there and you're baptized in the Jordan, uh, about 95% of the people are not baptized 
in the place where Jesus was. And there's a reason, because there's some raw sewage coming out of Jordan into the river right there. So most people don't want to be buried there, baptized there. And you feel like you're being buried there. <laughs> but the, the normal place is further up, further up north where it comes out of the Sea of Galilee. That's where people choose to be baptized in the Jordan River. But this is the actual location where Jesus was baptized by John. Uh, Beethoven Law, it's called. And it's also called the Valley of the Foreskins because this is where after the children of Israel wandered for 40 years and they crossed and they came up and they, they, on the east side of the Jordan and they came in the Dead Sea and then they came across the Jordan. This is the location they came to and they had not observed circumcision for 40 years. And so this is where the Valley of the Four, uh, Foreskins is where the men were all uh, circumcised before they went into battle with Jericho. It's in that area where Robert Winger lives now, but the, where he originally lived was San Francisco. And my wife was taking a group of pastors. Uh, this is before I actually knew her. My, my first wife died of cancer 11 years ago. The Rosemary and I have been married 10 years. This was before I knew Rosemary. And by the way, her, her name is Rosemary Schindler, as in through her first husband, related to Oscar Schindler family. And so she was taking a group of pastors from the San Francisco Bay Area, and she's kind of smuggled this guy, Robert Winger, on. He was involved in uh, sports business, promotion, uh, Gatorade, um, Monster Drink. He he's, was a team of people who came up with a logo for Monster Drink, which is Vav, 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 which is 666. They did that intentionally as kind of a joke, uh, and that's why you see the, the, the logo you do. But he got to Israel, and he was uh, standing there waiting as the group was ready to board the bus. And someone ran up to him and says, hey, I bought this shofar. Just hold it, please. And I got to go to the restroom. I'll be right back. He just picked it up. He never played one. He put it to his lips, sounded, without knowing, he sounded the Israeli Defense Forces wake-up call. <laughs> and so the military all came circled around him and say, who are you and what are you doing? What's going on? He says, I, do I don't know. I just gave, somebody gave me this and I blew it. Well, from that came an anointing, and he actually left his beautiful, beautiful home, San Francisco, and moved what originally kind of a tin box. I mean, it was like a cargo container in the heat and the desert of Beethoven Law, as God called him to. And he's become known as sort of the shofarist of the world, the best known in Israel. You'll see him playing a triple twist shofar in that picture but a two of them at the same time. And his amateur is so great, he can make different sounds, different tones, so harmony come out of both of them. And his mystery calls shofar so great. And, and, and I watch, we watch people as they, as they buy the shofars from it. He, he, he gets the best, the highest quality, and he tests them because he wants these to be available for the sounding of, to the welcoming of the Messiah someday. And, and he'll say, now I know it's gonna be hard for you to, to to, to play it. But he says, what I'm going to do first, I'm going to lay hands and pray an anointing upon you. And I watched this happen, oh, time after time. And he prays them, prays over them. And he says, okay, now do this and blow it. And the sound is stunning. But the hunger for the shofar globally, I'm convinced, is the desire of the human heart to hear the sound, the sound of the coming of the Messiah. There's another thing happening that's really unique. Gilgal, we always think of Gilgal as a town, and it is, but it's much more than that. Gilgal means a circle of stones. It's about the size of a football field. It's a place where when they came across the Jordan, now, remember when they came up on the east side of the Dead Sea, uh, the army came in uh, near Jericho, and, and you, Jericho and then the city of Ai where they were defeated. But there's another place they crossed, all the elderly women and children went further north to Adam, and they crossed there. In fact, they have found the relics of, of pottery shards left over, indicating millions of people crossed over at that place, and that's where they walked between Gerizim and Ebal. Blessing, curses, the two, the two mounts that Moses talked about twice, Joshua talked about it one time. But between that are places, these strange places, in the shape of a shoe, in the shape of a foot. They're large, they're about a football field in size. And they only discover these in the last few years. I mean, how many years has it been since they crossed the river? And, and, and now we're just finding them 3,400 years later. They have found six of them so far. They don't know if there's more or not. It's, it's the footprint of God upon the earth. It's the footprint of God. 
And in the midst of that is where they placed the Ark of the Covenant. We know the Ark of the Covenant was taken to Shiloh. It was there as the, as the, as the capital for 369 years before the story of David, the Philistines, and getting it back. David marching and taking on into Jerusalem where it became the capital. But there's a picture of what it looks like, one of the six that you can see right now. How is it possible? We're only just now discovering these locations where God rested. The Ark of the Covenant was unique and profound. What's the significance of us knowing that? And then one of my favorites of all, uh, Victor, I don't know if you had the privilege of going to Joshua's altar or not. Joshua's altar is, is just my favorite. Very few people get there. You can only get there if you arrange to go with IDF escort. My wife, we take our, our, our groups there uh, with some frequency. Not always can we do, do this, but a lot of the time. I mentioned already Mount Gerizim, then the valley, then Mount Ebal. On Mount Ebal, the Mount of Curses, is Joshua's altar. Now, it was built 3,400 years ago. It was only discovered in the 1980s, 1990, by Adam Zertal. Adam Zertal was a Jewish archaeologist who did not believe the Bible. When he discovered this and the Gilgals, it swung him around, and he suddenly believed the Tanakh in full, the Old Testament, we would call the Old Testament. He believed it and saw it was for real. This is a glimpse of what it looks like on the right, and then you see the glimpses of what it might have looked like back at that particular time. Uh, it, it's, it's breathtaking to go to this location. You, you have to walk the last stretch uh, to, to get there and, and, and pray for its protection. Uh, Palestinian Muslims have been going in, and even just a few weeks ago, uh, vandalized it. They've been trying to tear it down and grind up the stones uh, for building some roads. Uh, I have a good friend, Aaron Lipkin, who's doing his best to protect it. Now, in addition to that, how many of you have been following the story of the red heifers recently? Raise your hand. This is the story of two, two very close friends of mine. Uh, Isak Mamo is an Orthodox Jew in Jerusalem. Byron Stinson is a very successful businessman in Texas, a little bit south of Fort Worth, Granbury, Texas. The, many of you follow these stories. When we first heard about the possibility of this being legitimate, and an actual bona fide red heifer without blemish. We flew from San Diego out to Dallas-Fort Worth, where I used to live, just for the purpose of seeing this red heifer. And I wanted to see this myself. What happened is Isak, or, uh, Isaac, uh, or he goes by Saki, Saki Mamo contacted Byron and says, can you help me find a red heifer? Byron says, I'll start advertising to all the cattlemen around, around Texas, which he did. They needed a red heifer without a blemish, without white hair, without red, black hair, without any of their colors, without any, any markings of any kind or any blemish. During COVID, the veterinarians couldn't travel as much, and they were not able to ear tab, ear mark the young calves as they were born. So that freed up a whole lot of potential calves to look at. So the Jewish rabbis began flying over to see what they might discover. And if by faith this clicker will work, we will, we will see it. Well, I'm going to need, uh, oh, okay. The pastor, is Numbers chapter 19 is the scripture about the red heifer. The red heifer is not a sacrifice, it's a ceremony. Big difference. Now, it's true that the red heifer loses its life. They take the ashes from the red heifer, mix it with cedar, hiss up in certain kind of water. And there's a lot of symbolism in that. Well, I won't take time to go into that right now. To us as Christians, it represents the cleansing blood of Jesus quite candidly. But to the Jewish people, this is extremely significant, Numbers chapter 19. Now, according to the Jewish tradition, the red heifer, when it would occur, when it was brought, it could not have contact with death, nor could the priest. Well, the Kidron Valley is all cemetery. So they built the red heifer bridge. There's no archaeological remains of this at all, because it was presumably all wood. But it was even designed in such a way, the arches, a complex arrangement of arches, so there's no contact with, with death. They would bring it across from what you're seeing is the Temple Mount, where Solomon's temple was, across this grand ravine, the Kidron Valley, to the Mount of Olives. And this is where the sacrifice took place, which, by the way, that's where Jesus was crucified, and that's where he was buried, and that's where he was resurrected, and that's when he's coming again, and that's where he ascended. It's Mount of Olives, not these other places you hear about. But this is, and that's why it's even symbolic of the location, the location of the red heifer. And what, the reason when Jesus was crucified there, the evidence is, I think, rather overwhelming to me. Not everybody's going to agree with this, but 
when the centurion stood there and Jesus died, and he said, oh my goodness, he, he's God. In that moment, something occurred that caused him to say he's God. Now, it wasn't because it's been dark in the middle of the day, it's been dark for some hours. Not because of earthquake, they have earthquakes with some frequency that they're used to. This was because he would have been in alignment with that grain temple that was torn in two, and the, the great veil that was torn in two. And the brightness of that, he would have been hit with a force of a light from the Holy of Holies as in a moment Jesus died. And, and Matthew in Hebrew sorts this out, says the body of Jesus, is, represent, that veil represents the body of, of Jesus. So this is the place of the sacrifice. On top of that, the ancient tabernacle, when they traveled around, when there was a sacrifice for sin, it had to be a thousand furlongs, that's 1,500 feet, 1,500 feet east of, of the tabernacle. We come to the temple and the, the, it's continued. Well, what, where is that? Well, it's right on the Mount of Olives. And that's where the red heifer ceremony would take place. In Jewish tradition, there have been nine times in Jewish history that this has taken place. In Jewish oral tradition, the 10th one is supposed to be either done by the Messiah or for the Messiah, one of the two. So as we progress in this story, Byron starts advertising, any Texas farmers want to help me, ranchers help me find a red heifer that's completely spotless. The rabbis flew over, they begin finding a number of them, they reduced them down to five, and he said, we want to ship these back to Israel. The government in Israel said, we do not accept livestock from the United States. Saki Mamo said to the government, these are not livestock, these are my pets. And they said, oh, pets we accept, so you can bring them back. <laughs> so these five heifers, a heifer just, if you're not raised on a farm, uh, is bovine, is a cow is a bovine that has been impregnated and given birth. A heifer has not been impregnated, has not yet given birth. So it's a female. And so here is these female cows. They're coming back, shipped of them, five of them shipped by American Airlines to bring them back to Israel. And they're right now in Shiloh. Three, uh, two of the three have disqualified themselves by a white hair or, or a black hair. One of them is in the process probably of disqualifying. They'll use those for breeding purposes. The red heifer has to be three years old, but in the Jewish tradition, if you're two years, you're starting your third year. So two years and one month qualifies. They've all qualified by age. You don't age out, so they can still ha ha have it. Uh, but they are now waiting for the time for the red heifer ceremony. I've been there to Shiloh and seen them there. They're very well taken care of cattle, I assure you. I wanted you to see the people that I'm talking about. The guy second from the left, second from the left, that's Saki Mamo. Uh, he's the Orthodox Jew from Israel. Go fourth from the left, the guy in the red sweatshirt or maroon sweatshirt, that's Byron Stinson from Texas. These are the two guys who've really invested themselves enormously uh, in this process. There have been attempts through the years to find a red heifer that was, was spotless, and every one of them disqualified themselves, in, and they haven't found one in the last 2,000 years. Let's go a little bit further now in the story. Numbers chapter 19, you can read it when you get home, but Numbers 19 is the process they go through in the red heifer ceremony. Now, we have the red heifer, but we need some land. And the Mount of Olives is where the red heifer ceremony has to take place. But the Mount of Olives is extremely expensive, and it's owned by Muslims. And a Muslim can't sell to a Jew or he'd be killed. But through a complex process, and I don't know all the steps that were taken here, very complex process, going through a number of entities in between, uh, they now own Tuduma. Tuduma is like a half an acre on the Mount of Olives. They have the location, I have, I have been there to that actual location and seen it, and they're prepared for the moment. Did you notice that on the 100th day of the war, after Hamas attacked Israel, on the 100th day of the war, the Hamas top leadership made a speech, and in his speech, he said, one of the reasons we did this is because you brought those red cows here. The Muslims are aware of the significance of what this means in Jewish eschatology, Jewish timing. So where are we right now in this process? This is a look from the Mount of Olives across 
and we're looking across the Kidron Valley, and there you see the gold dome, the dome of the rock, and you see the Alaska Mosque on the, on the left. So we've got, we're on the right side on Mount of Olives. So he was able to buy, they were able to buy land, uh, and this is, of course, the picture of the bridge once again that we spoke of earlier that they had. And here's what it looks like from the land that they were able to buy, and they have the Tuduma. So we have the red, we have the red cow, we have the red heifer, and we have the land for this process. Now, there's a lot of details. Uh, they're working through many complexities. As you can imagine, everything in Israel is very, very complex. But there's another aspect to it. And that is, I said to my friend Saki, so is the order of things and Jewish understanding, the heifer, and then you have to have the land to do it on, and, and then you build the temple, and then the Messiah comes. Is that the proper order? He says, oh, you Christians, you always have to have everything ordered out. We don't know. But later on, as I listen to his conversation, that's what I keep hearing is basically that particular order. So let me take you on a wild journey for the next few moments. Saki Mamo, my friend in Israel, was invited by the Papua, Papua New Guinea prime minister to come to his country. And his response was, I don't even know where Papua New Guinea is. Now, it's for those in north of Australia, he says, it's a 25-hour trip. Why on earth would I come to this tiny little island? But he consented to come, and he flew to Papua New Guinea, and he met the prime minister. And when he got there, the prime minister said these words. By the way, there's 850 tribes, uh, very primitive tribes, and 850 different languages spoken in that small area. Those of you that follow Wycliffe Bible translation know why the heavy emphasis on that nation, because there's so many languages uh, there. And so he got there and said, what have I come for? He was greeted in a very wonderful way. The prime minister met him and said, this is my birthday, my 50th birthday. I don't want a gift, I want to give you a gift. And he says, what is that? Saki brought pictures of the temple, and so they would know about the temple being restored. They already knew all about that. And by the way, they're the fifth nation of the nations of the world that recognized Israel by moving their embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, extremely important act. They were the fifth nation to do that. We just need 190 more nations to follow them in that process. But he got there and he was introduced, Saki Mama was introduced to the man who's the Secretary of Interior Security. That's a fancy way of saying he's a cop and, he's, and he was told by the Prime Minister, the interior tribes all trust this man. Go with this man if you would and I will take you there if this clicker will start working again. So uh, I can't get it to respond. Any help you can be from the computer back there? <clears throat> Go to the next one. And so Saki Mamo flew on the plane with the Minister of Interior Security to go to one of the tribes. And when he got there, <clears throat> they said, we are the people who supplied the gold for Solomon's temple 3,000 years ago. He said, what are you talking about? He says, that's oral tradition, and oral tradition in our culture is very accurate. He said, see this enormous pit we're going to take you to? This enormous pit was from the digging of the gold for Solomon's temple. He said, how is this possible? And so they directed him to, well, we got an uncooperative... Yeah, I love technology until I have to use it. Okay. There we go. Now, I want you to look at this scripture. It says, now when the Queen of Sheba heard, so the Queen of Sheba comes, in verse 2, she brought a lot of gold, and she brought 120 talents of gold. But, so that's not enough to do the temple. But the ships of Hiram, now what's Hiram? That's Tyre, that's modern-day Lebanon. The ships were used by Israel, and they brought gold from Ophir. Now go to 14, and there was 666 talents of gold. That's a billion dollars of gold, by the way. And it took them three years, verse 22, to cycle and make the trip to bring it. The Queen of Sheba's gold, that would have been three weeks trip at most, coming just from the south. 
But the Hiram ships took three years to go to Ophir. And they, these people in Papua New Guinea said to my friend, he said, we are the tribe of Ophia. Why do you think they call us the Solomon's Islands around us? We provided that gold. We have the largest gold depository in the world underground. And so we're going to start mining the gold, and we're going to give one-third to the mining company, one-third we're going to keep, and one-third we're going to give to Israel for the third temple to be built. <laughs> the first time I ever shared this was recent. By the way, I wasn't allowed to share this. Only my, I only shared my wife. I did not tell anyone except my wife. Until January 31st, Saki and Byron gave me permission. I invited them to Washington, D.C. in a museum of the Bible at, a, at the National Gathering for Prayer and Repentance. We took a, a five-hour event, and we interviewed them at length, and it became public knowledge at that point, what I'm now, what I'm now sharing. I shared this, these, these pictures in Houston not too long ago. I called by, my buddy Byron. I said, can you come, come on down? I'll turn the sermon over to you at the end because you're the guy. I'm not. I'm just reporting what you're doing. So he came down. While he was there, he got a text from another country. It says, we will provide the silver for your nation. My wife and I were just in Armenia. We met with a number of people, government leaders. As we were leaving, we were leaving the home of a businessman at midnight one night. And I noticed something on the wall. I said, what, what, what do you do? And I learned among all the other things he owns, he, own, he owns mines. He says, I'm buying gold mines right now. I said, can I connect you with some people? They need your help right now. I don't know all that God's doing, but he, this is quite stunning, what has just developed fairly recently. So we have the red heifer. We have the land. We, we may have the red heifer. We'll see if these two, uh, they, so far two of them have still qualified at this point. They can disqualify if they have a blemish or a scar or something or white hair. But at this point, they're qualified. We have the land. Now they, they're working through the technicalities of that. Remember their Jewish tradition. They think the 10th time. It's either done for the Messiah or by the Messiah. And now they have the goal for the temple. If you've been over there, you know the Temple Institute. They have about everything else you can possibly imagine. The Temple Institute means they have everything down to just the, the even the, the, the analysis of the structure of the every thread on the priestly garments. The Temple Institute, everything is ready for the temple to be built. But there's a problem. Jews respect other people's religions, and they won't tear down their religious buildings, as you well know. Dome of the Rock, controlled by the Muslims, is there, and Alaska Mosque is there. <clears throat> so it would look like the temple can't be built until those are destroyed somehow. But how is that? How do get an earthquake? What's going to happen? Will some crazy man blow them up? Uh, who, who, who knows? Who knows what's going to happen? And God says, it's not that we need a third temple as followers of Yeshua. We, we don't. But as part of prophecy, that's part of it. And we know that well, the negative is the, the deconsecration of it on the part of the Antichrist. We, under, we understand those dynamics, but it's a part of the closure of history. Well, along comes a lady named Nancy Del Grande. Now, I've only recently met her by phone and by Zoom. I've never met her in person. She's a long-term friend of my wife. And when I found out what she'd done, I started interviewing her. She was featured even on, this is in Times Square, New York City. It's where my wife happens to be right now. Now, this, this picture is not on Times Square now, but this lady is a brilliant physicist. She's 89 years of age now and still has a very clear mind. But she was featured on, 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 in Times Square and the enormous uh, lit, lit pictures that are, that are there. She, had, she developed, she, she comes from out of New York City. Her father was a professor at Columbia. In a basement under his office is where the brainiacs came together for the Manhattan Project. If you know Manhattan Project, you'll know that's where they developed the atomic bomb that took out Nagasaki and Hiroshima. And so she grew up in a family of just brilliance. And by the time she was six, seven, eight, she was very advanced in science, became a physicist. She developed a, a, a device by which you could fly over with a drone or a plane and detect what was under the surface, specifically if there were tunnels. Thermal imaging, I think it's like 20,000 
photographs per second that are taken. And they do it at different seasons of the year. It's not like a seismic refraction, but it's some kind of thermal imaging that gives you an indication of temperature changes that helps you track where tunnels are. And this has been used some to track some of the tunnels relating to Hamas. She reported that her her equipment has been destroyed in, in the war. I don't know more detail about that particular part. But she was allowed, she was the only female, along with a group of men, scientists, that were allowed to fly, I'm not sure if they were planes or drones, over the Temple Mount in such a way a number of times to be able to do an analysis below the surface of the Temple Mount. And what they discovered was where there was a tunnel called the nostrils. It's actually two tunnels right side by side, where the blood and the water would flow from the altar of the ancient temple. Why would this be significant? It's because then you would know where the altar was, and once knowing where the altar was, you'd know where the whole temple exactly was located at one time. And so through her research, she discovered that it starts on the north side of the, the gold dome, the dome of the rock, And from there, it goes at an angle. You can see it, the red line. She's marked there in the dark lines where the original temple would have been. The red marking, red line, is the underground tunnel or the nostrils or the drainage pipe. Picture it, a drainage pipe. Two of them alongside each other that would have flowed to the corner and then underneath the, uh, out towards the Kidron Valley. Now, what this means, and I don't know how to interpret this quite candidly, so I'm not making claims. What it means is the temple could actually be built without the destruction of these other buildings. What does that actually, how's that play out? God knows and I don't. I'm just letting you know that this kind of a discovery is really quite profound and quite significant. And then there's this stunning discovery, and there's all kinds of pieces that I'm not permitted to talk about that I so want to, but artifacts from the birthplace of the Messiah. Now, what do we mean by that? Let's walk through. In Genesis 35, 21, the Migdal Eder is referred to. Migdal Eder is the tower of the flock. This is a specific location Jacob went to right after his wife died, and he grieved there. So the Migdal Eder is first mentioned in Genesis. And then it's mentioned in Micah 4, 8. The Migdal Eder, Tower of the Flock. This is the place where it's prophesied in Micah 4, 8. We're going to see more in, in Micah 5, 2, where Christ is going to be born. This is a prophecy. Now we go to Micah 5, 2. In Micah 5, 2, it now says Bethlehem Ephratah. This is going to be the place. So we've got two clues from Micah. The Migdal Eder, the Tower of the Flock, Bethlehem Ephratah, emphasize that second one for a moment. Now, what this means, Ephratah, by the way, was that beautiful valley. Picture this. Here's Jerusalem. Here's Rakat Ramal. And then then here is is this beautiful valley, very fruitful valley. Ephratah, fruitful, what it means. Then Bethlehem here on, on, on the hill. So this area here is called Bethlehem Ephratah, or sometimes just Ephratah, before you get actually to Bethlehem located more on the hill. This is the oldest known map uh, of Israel. It's from the year 540, the Madaba map. On that, see the football in the middle. Uh, By the way, this is oriented a strange, it's oriented east. It's not oriented north like you generally think of, of, of of your maps. There's that football is Jerusalem. Now let's go a little bit closer on that football. This, this map exists in, in, uh, in, in Jordan. Now now the football is a little clear. That's this Jerusalem. You look to the right of that, and you'll see Ephrata and next to that Bethlehem. Let's see if we can go in a little bit tighter. Now you can see it a little bit more. Again, Ephrata is, and it looks, the imagery, this is a mosaic on a floor, the imagery is a woman giving birth, where the red arrow is, where the number three is. Number two is, would be where the red arrow is, where Bethlehem is. This Ephrata, this valley, Bethlehem Ephrata, is extremely significant. 
This is where it is believed the Migdal Ader is. There's a circle of trees at that location right now. This land is owned by the Catholic Church. It's just fenced off. And it's been known, we believe, as, as early as 1958, the things that I'm now telling you, but we're only learning about even right now. This area is the actual, we believe, birthplace of Christ, where the lambs, the perfect lambs were born and taken five miles north to Solomon's temple. That's a rendering of Solomon's temple. Here is that area. Now, what's significant about it is this. When, when in Luke, in Luke, when they come with the announcement, the angels come with the announcement and say he's going to be born wrapped in swaddling cloths. That's all the clue they give the location. How in the world do the shepherds know where to go? He'll be, you'll find him wrapped in swaddling cloths. That's not much of a clue, unless you're a sophisticated, erudite, highly educated shepherd who's been put there in that area for the purpose of finding the perfect lamb. These were highly sophisticated shepherds. In my early days, I used to preach sermons about this motley crew, smelly shepherds. I was wrong. That's not a, a smelly barn. That was wrong. I told the best I knew, but I was wrong. Pretty hard for a preacher to say. These were highly trained, sophisticated shepherds who were there assigned to find perfect lambs and to wrap them in swaddling cloths. So when the angel said, you will find him wrapped in swaddling cloths, they knew there's one place, the Migdal Ader, the Tower of the Flock. We know exactly where to find him, where Jesus was born. Where did Mary get swaddling cloths? Who had Mary been with? Elizabeth over in Ein Cairn. Who was Elizabeth, her cousin? As, you, as the two ladies come together, you know the story well. In the womb, John leapt, leaped when he came into the presence of the divine one, Jesus, in the womb of Mary. Who was Elizabeth's husband, Zechariah? What was Zechariah's task? He was a priest in the temple. What was their assignment? Two weeks a year, they'd go in and minister. You can go to Chronicles and you can see the actual, the actual structure, the priest going in their assigned times. This is why we know Jesus was born around October, September. He was conceived around what we call Christmas, but he was born uh, tabernacles. He tabernacled among us. And so she, her husband, comes out of the temple. What did they do with their garments when they came out of the temples? They shredded them. What did they do with them next? They used them to swaddle perfect lambs to keep them protected for the sacrifice in the temple. And so Mary has these swaddling cloths, presumably from her cousin, who husband had just been in there and would have had access to this. And so the shepherds here, with the words, you'll find him wrapped in swaddling cloths. And it's already told us it's going to happen in Bethlehem, Ephrata. Now, the reason Bethlehem on the hill gets chosen is because Constantine sent his mother, Helena, there in 300 to try to find some of these locations. She probably got some right, but she missed it terribly on the place of the crucifixion and the place of the birth. It's not church of the nativity. Mary would have climbed, had to climb quite a hill to get there. You go to this location, at this location, there's unusual markings that the cave would have been the place, and there's markings on these caves. This is a, a place where you washed your feet when you arrived there. The, the hotel that was too full was actually kind of a cave. And so she would have to gone just a few feet to the Migdal Ader that would have fulfilled Micah chapter 4, verse 8, and Micah chapter 5, verse 2, Bethlehem Ephrata at the Migdal Ader, the tower of the flock. What's unusual in what they found there, and there's a thousand artifacts. This is one of them. This is a cup 
the only people who would have cups that had to be so pure as stone would be the high priestly group. Other pe people would have wooden carved out cups. They would have cups of this nature. There were about a thousand artifacts. Now, how they got from there to where they now are is a jolting story. And since we're on live stream and such, it's a story that, that I can't go into. But these thousand artifacts are now in the United States by a, a stunning story. And they are available for you to go see by appointment in the Midwest. And I'll simply give the information to your pastor. And if you want to go there, you can make appointments. Pastor, you'll want to go and see these. It's, it's, it's breathtaking to see. And they're in this country, in the, in the Midwest. Quite a story behind how they got there. This is back at the Migdal Ader. You can go there and Byron Stinson will take you on a private personal tour of this area. Very few people, probably only about 1,500 out of the 4 million people per year that go there have had the privilege of going to the Migdal Ader in Bethlehem, Ephrata. And there's just amazing mosaics there. The early Christians all wanted to worship here. The early Christians immediately, this was their place. Why? They knew its significance. Why did the early Christians all want to worship on the Mount of Olives? Why did the early Christians all want to be buried on the Mount of Olives? Now, this, this, this location is five miles south of it. Or why, did they, why were the early church Christians wanting to make sure they were at this location? Because this is the burial, this is the birthplace of Jesus. I believe, and Mount of Olives is the place where he was crucified and where he was buried, where he resurrected, it's where he ascended, it's where he's coming back again. Now, what does that mean to us? Here's, here's by the way, the word in, in Luke, when it talks about the manger, for our little Christmas programs, we put together some little pieces of wood. I grew up on a farm, I know what a manger is, we feed cattle. Horses eat out of a manger. We understand what a manger is, is, but the word there technically translated means birthing stall, not manger, kind of wood thrown together. And this is uh, one of the birthing stalls from that location, which is in the United States. You can easily go and visit it by appointment only at this juncture. They haven't formally opened this museum to the, to the public. They're working through all the legal ramifications of this. It, it came uh, unannounced. I mean, it wasn't like people pursued it at all. It, it, it's a bizarre story, but it's now available for people to visit, and you can get a very wonderful tour of that. What does all of this mean? What all this means is God is doing something. And so consequently, I am encouraging every one of you by live stream, be prepared. I just for the first time saw the clock, and my time is up. In eternity, there's, time, there's no problem with me preaching as long as I want. But I did, I did not realize that's the actual time on there. Consequently, Lord Jesus, we come to you in wonderful anticipation and excitement for what you're about to do. In the coming of the Messiah, we wait with anticipation and joy in our hearts. And Lord, I pray that everyone that's listening to me is prepared to meet him by confession of their sins before him repentance from sins, turning to Jesus, declaring Him Savior and Lord, so they're prepared for that soon and glorious coming of the Messiah. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. I want you to welcome my friend and the pastor of the Ben Church, Pastor Shane Warren. Would you do it? Come on, let him know it. Thank you so much. How about let's give Jesus some glory in the house because he's the one that deserves it, amen? Well, it, it was such an honor and a privilege to be here with you guys, to be with my very dear friends, uh, Mr. Uh, Pastor Joy and Miss Rita. They are an incredible people, and I'm not going to take a lot of time talking about our friendship, but over 10 years ago, over a decade ago, I sat in a car with him in Houston, Texas. We connected for the first time and he has been such a blessing to my life. I just want to correct something said. So we've outgrown two facilities. We've actually outgrown six facilities in three years. Six facilities in three years. And so uh, the last time I was here, your pastor gave me a significant honorarium. I took all of that, 100% of that back. So you've got seed in the ground. 
in Cookville, Tennessee, and every single week, people get saved by the dozens every single week. And so you've got seed in the ground. I just wanted to say thank you for that. And it's such a pleasure to be able to uh, have been uh, here to hear Dr. Garlow. Oh my goodness. Makes me not even want to talk. Right? So you just listen to brilliance and now you get to listen to Tennessee hillbilly. So I'm just warning you. I want you to take a Bible out with me if you can, or you can follow along on the screen. I will be moving very quickly and you will not be able to take notes. But if you'll ask me after service, I'll give you my notes personally so you can go home and study them. I want to talk to you today about kingdom occupation. Kingdom occupation. At the end of my message, either today or tomorrow, I'm gonna give you a word from the Lord that God gave me a year ago about the spirit of Jezebel ascending to the platform. You're watching the spirit of Jezebel right now walking to the platform. And the Lord gave me a word a year to a year and a half ago and told me, and I shared it with my church, it's on video, that President Biden would not make it through his final year, but that the platform was being built for the spirit of Jezebel. And then as your pastor shared today, he said there would be a conflict of divine power that would take place. And he, in in this word from the Lord, and I'm not real big on, I am big on prophecy, but I'm not real big on banking everything on what somebody says in prophecy. We have a more sure word of prophecy called the word of God we can bank our life on. But I believe that what I saw and what I, what the Lord gave me to say is coming to pass and the Lord will give me time At the end, I'm going to share it with you. If not, I'll share it tomorrow morning during my message. But I want to go to Luke chapter 19, verse 11 through 13. I'm going to read two passages of scripture here for just a moment. In Luke chapter 19, the scripture says, And as they heard these things, he added and he spoke a parable because he was near to Jerusalem. And because that they thought the kingdom of God should immediately appear, he said, therefore, a certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. And he called his 10 servants and he delivered them 10 pounds. And he said unto them, occupy till I come. I want you to say those four words really loud, please. Occupy till I come. One more time and get them in your spirit. Occupy till I come. I want to draw your attention now to the book of Ephesians chapter 3, verses 9 through 11. Paul said, and to make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the ages was hidden in God who created all things through Jesus Christ to the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and the powers which are in the heavenly places according to the eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. There was a ragtag Jewish force that was fanned out across a hill 12 miles outside of Jerusalem at a place called Adassa. It was comprised mostly of farmers, priests, and a few craftsmen. They were very poorly armed, and they numbered no more than just a few hundred men. Their leader was a royal priest by the name of Judas Maccabeus. He was known to all of his followers as the hammer. That day, he looked out across the valley, this jagged valley, at the well-trained forces of the Seleucid Greeks. The Greek general Nicanor and more than 9,000 battle-hardened soldiers were arrayed against these Jewish rebels on that day. The year was 161 BC, and this impending battle had been triggered by some of the Jews' refusal to be Hellenized. That is, they refused to be absorbed into the culture that was arising in their day by the conquering Greeks. You see, the Greeks worship many gods, the Jews only one. The Greeks had very loose moral code. The Jews had a very strict 
detailed one. It was on that day an irreconcilable clash of worldviews. The final straw had come just a few weeks earlier when the Jews could not take it anymore as this Greek culture was imposing itself upon their culture. It came when the Greek inner, uh, emperor Antiochus Epiphanes erected an idol in the holy temple and demanded that the Jewish priest sacrifice a pig on the altar in the most holy place and that all the priests had to bow, bow down to this idol. When the priest was, who was finally found was willing to commit this act, everything immediately turned on its head and a war broke out. The hammer, Judas Maccabeus, rose up in revolt against the culture that the Greeks were trying to impose upon the people that day. Now, I want to warn you before I get into my message today, I intend to offend everybody who's listening to me. I am tired of weak, milly mouth loose backbone preachers who have nothing to say because they have nothing to stand for. Today, I intend to be a hammer in the hands of the Holy Spirit to smash the idols that our culture have erected. And I intend to turn our hearts back toward the God that we're supposed to serve and we say that we believe in. In the midst of a culture that is right now calling for Christians to shriek back and to shut their mouths and go into hiding and let the darkness prevail. I'm here this morning to prophetically call for every born again, spirit filled child of the King to absolutely stand up and to be a counter culture Christian and to make a stand for the gospel of Jesus Christ. In the 18th century, a generation fought for America's independence from British rule. In the 19th century, a generation fought for the pers to per uh, persevere or preserve rather the union from those who would tear it apart. In the 20th century, a generation fought to defend democracy from the forces of tyranny and oppression in both Europe and the Pacific. But I want you to hear me today. In the day in which we live in the 21st century, this will be a generation that will have to fight for the preservation and the propagation of a culture that is based on nothing but truth alone. And there's only one place to really find truth anymore. There's really only been one place to find truth. Jesus said, my word is truth. Now, for those of you who are like me, you're worn out. You're like me, you're weary. You're like me, you're frustrated. You're like me, you really feel like giving up and throwing in the towel on the culture in which we live. And it almost looks hopeless like Pastor said. I want to encourage you with something today and I want you to hear me. I believe that turning our backs on the culture that we're facing right now is an absolute betrayal of our biblical mandate. It is a betrayal of our own heritage because if we turn our back on this culture right now, it denies God's sovereignty over all of life. And you hear me today that nothing can be deadlier for the church. Nothing is more ill-timed for our society than for the church to raise a white flag in the middle of the culture and say, if you want to go to hell in a handbasket, just have your way. To abandon the battlefield now is to desert the cause and to give up on the belief in the words of our Lord who promised you and I that in the last days he would pour out his spirit on all flesh and our sons and our daughters would prophesy. We cannot give up our hope. We cannot give up our appeal to heaven for God to do what he said that he would do. 
Because I can promise you that we are now standing in a day like Elijah the prophet, where the prophets of Baal have what they want to say and preachers are saying what they want to say, but it is time for those who are on the Lord's side to stop halting between two opinions and to say, Lord, let your kingdom come on earth as it is in America. In this day of dreaded darkness covering the earth, and gross darkness covering the people like Isaiah the prophet proclaimed, you and I must heed to the words of the Lord Jesus, occupy till he comes. That means we've got to have occupation of the kingdom, kingdom occupation in the church house. We need kingdom occupation in your house. We got to have kingdom occupation in every schoolhouse in America. And we need kingdom occupation all the way at the White House in Washington, D.C. Now, I'm not gonna make any bones about it and I'm not gonna apologize because I'm too old for that and I'm too tired. But make, make no mistake, most people on the other side of conservative Christianity absolutely hate us. And they despise everything that we stand for. But regardless, of where everybody else stands in this culture. Our biblical mandate is to love them, to bless them, but to still stand up and herald truth in the midst of lies. Our job as salt and light is to challenge this culture. Yes, even argue for the superiority and the accuracy of once again a biblical world view in our culture. I want you to hear me today. When worldviews collides, nations hang in the balance. And herein lies the source of the great conflict that you and I are in right now. The conflict is about competing worldviews. Now because worldviews are pertinent to everyone's life, the way they, they think and the way they eventually act and because virtually all worldviews promise salvation and utopia, then what we need to do is for just a moment we need to study some worldviews to understand the critical importance of them. In his book, Future Shock, the author Alvin Toffler describes them, worldviews, as the mental models of the world and each of us carry these mental models in our head. Let me talk about worldviews for a moment. And again, some of this is gonna be offensive, but it'll only be offensive if you don't understand who you are in Jesus. When the singer-songwriter Sheryl Crow refers to the expected US invasion of Iraq in days gone by, and says, and I quote, I think war is based in greed and there are huge karmic retributions that will follow. I think that war is never the answer to solving any problems. The best way to solve problems is not to have any enemies at all. It sounds good, but she's actually giving us insight into her worldview. When the late scientist Carl Sagan declared, and I quote, the cosmos is all there ever is and all there ever was and all there ever will be. He made a clear representation to our God who was, who is, and who is to come. And he made clear the cornerstone of his worldview. When Peter Singer who was the holder of the prestigious Ira DeCamp professorship in bioethics at Princeton University, writes, and I quote, human babies are not born self-aware. Human babies are not capable of grasping that they exist over time. Human babies are not persons. But yet then he turns around with the same pen and the same ink and writes, animals are self-aware. 
And therefore, the life of a newborn is of less value than a pig, a dog, and even a chimpanzee. He, along with millions of others of pro-choice advocates all around the world, are revealing quite a bit about their worldview. When you have pop stars who can, with a tweet, get 10 million responses to sway a vote, yet parade on the platforms in their concerts, dressed provocatively or worse yet, dressed like demons, and they can turn the heart of the culture, they are giving you an insight into their worldview. Now why is all of this important? Because most Christians don't know and most Christians don't understand the conflicting worldviews with the biblical worldviews. In fact, I wanna submit to you that most Christians don't even know what a Christian biblical worldview is. They don't understand, especially in America, we were founded upon biblical principles. Even many, most of the laws, all the way down to bankruptcy laws, find their origins in the scriptures of the Old Testament. Most, if not all of our forefathers, held up those principles to guide this nation. The Christian biblical worldview is simply this in a nutshell, that every single person born into the human race is born with a nature bent towards sin. And left to themselves long enough, innocence will become rebellion. And they are lost into an eternity without God. So God, in his divine providence, before there was ever time in existence, said there had to be a plan of redemption. And Jesus, the word of God, became the lamb slain before the foundations of the world. Jesus was not God's reaction to the problems of the world. Jesus was God's answer before there was ever a problem. Woo, glory, hallelujah. He was not only the doctor, he is also the cure for the sin of humanity. And so therefore, the gospel is, is that the word took on flesh, dwelt among us without sin, and though he who knew no sin hung upon a cross and became sin, that you and I might become the righteousness of God in Christ. He died a sinner's death. He was not a sinner, but he died a sinner's death. He, it's, these are old words we need to go back to. Things like the propitiation for our sin so that we could be justified. Justified means that now I stand legally before God if I've given my life to Christ as if I had never done it. Come on, I don't stand there in my own righteousness. I stand there in the righteousness that Jesus gave me at Calvary. Somebody ought to praise the Lord right now that you're not basing this on yourself. that that man who died was put in a tomb. And three days later, the same Holy Ghost that dwells in you and me raised his body from that grave, was seen of many witnesses, and then ascended to the Father and sat at the right hand until every one of his enemies becomes his footstool. That is the good news of Jesus Christ. That is our worldview. And that book that you hold in your hand that we call a Bible, that people gave their lives for, shed blood for, so you could have it in your hand, tells you where you stand on every single cultural issue. And we cannot be like some Christians who are willing like that priest was to offer that, I, that sacrifice in the temple that day. We have to be like Judas Maccabeus in the face of this culture. Look over, over a well-armed, well-equipped media that tells us what we ought to believe and say we will not bend and we will not bow. We will stand for the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ even 
even in the midst of lies and corruption. So, why do I need to talk about worldviews for a moment? Because worldview is destiny. It's destiny for individuals and it's destiny for civilizations. Here's what you need to know at the core of every worldview is an answer, right or wrong. It's an answer, one key question. Every worldview answers one key question. Who or what is God? Or to put it in another way, who's mankind's Messiah? That is really the question. So let me just talk to you about what we're facing right now. The first worldview is humanism. Humanism is man equals God. Now, by their own definition, humanists are those who believe in the primacy of the human being. The original Humanist Manifesto, which was written in 1933, was actually penned by a Unitarian minister, believe it or not, Raymond Bragg. Listen to the words that he wrote. Today, man's larger understanding of the universe is scientific achievement. This is a preacher. And deeper appreciation of brotherhood have created a situation which requires a new statement of the means and purposes of religion. Such a vital, fearless, and frank religion capable of furnishing adequate social goals and personal satisfactions may appear to many people as a complete break with the past. While this age does owe a vast debt to the tradition, traditional religions, it is nonetheless obvious that any religion that can hope to be synthesizing or dynamic force for today must be shaped for the needs of this age. To establish such a religion is a major necessity of the present. Why is 75% of the churches in America not based on a biblical worldview? I'll tell you why. Because they've allowed humanism to enter in. The culture has seeped into the church. Humanists, although overwhelmingly most of the time are atheists and agnostic, are not people without a Messiah. For the humanists, their savior is humanity itself. As the humani uh, Humanist Manifesto number two declares, humans are responsible for what we are and will become. No deity will save us, and I quote, we must save ourselves. Of course, humanist ideas weren't a 20th century, 20th century invention. They go back a little farther, as far as the Garden of Eden. In fact, Professor Herbert Schlossberg wrote, Eve was the very first humanist. How corrupt. He was referring to the appeal that the serpent made to Eve's pride when, she, when, when he told her that you won't surely die. Humanists proclaim that the universe is self-existing, that it's not created. As a result, man is a part of nature and has emerged as a result of this continuous process of evolution. For the humanists, science is the only proper tool for understanding who we are and our part in nature. And ladies and gentlemen, this philosophy, along with the others, this is the cornerstone of the philosophy that is being pumped down your children's throat eight hours a day in our public school system. And unfortunately, is being touted as the new way that church is supposed to be done in the world. That's not the only thing we're facing in this culture. These things build one upon another. Now I come to Marxism or statism. Marxism is the government equals God. It was founded by none other than Karl Marx in 18, from 1818 to 1883. Marx was an atheist long before he was a socialist or the ideological father of modern communism. In fact, listen to me, his rejection of God was the starting point and the foundation of everything else that he came to espouse. This militant atheism is one of several uh, attributes Marxism shares with its co cousin, secular humanism. He was an atheist. 
Karl Marx saw himself as a champion of the poor, a champion of the exploited working class. Does this sound like anything you've heard recently in a debate? With the conviction of a prophet, he believed natural and economic forces were moving history toward a predetermined end, a series of upheavals and revolutions that would result in the dictatorship of the proletariat. In other words, Karl Marx foresaw, and these are his words, a utopia, a paradise on earth in which there would be no extremes of poverty or wealth, no rich ruling class. Each person's labor would be filled with purpose and dignity as it served the greater collective of the good of society. Sounds like wonderful stuff. It's easy to buy into until you do a little bit of research on history. To Europe's millions of hardworking poor in the early stages of the Industrial Revolution, particularly in places like Tsarist Russia at the time, this philosophy all looked pretty attractive on paper. But of course, Marxism hasn't worked out quite so well for common folks in actual places anywhere anywhere in the world where they bought into it. It is conservatively estimated that a mere handful of decades, in just a handful of decades, more than 20 million people in the former Soviet Union died in Lenin and Stalin's political purges and government-induced famines and the infamous gulags. In China, Mao Zedong took Marxist theology and used it as a roadmap for his, quote, cultural revolution, end quote, and the great leap forward and encouraged people to turn the page. Does that sound familiar? And they did. And upwards to 60 million people either starved to death or were killed. In Vietnam, more than 850,000 died in re-education camps alone after the withdrawal of the American military presence. Right now, as I stand here in this pul pulpit, research, recent research has estimated that the 20th century victims of communism at more than 100 million people in number. And yet, this ideology that rejects the biblical, biblical view of man as fallen and sinful and in need of redemption carries the assumption that man is basically good and perfectible by himself. That it's not man's inner problem, it is man's environment, the system in which he lives that's making him so selfish and brutish. And so, therefore, Marx and his friends reason that absolute power to control man's environment has to be vested in the government. And that the government can build a utopia in which man would thrive. That's why whenever Marxism has been planted in fertile soil, tyranny has bloomed. And it is blooming in America right now. And we need to wake up to what it is. So now we have humanism and Marxism, right? Man is God, and now the government is God. And then we have this philosophy, materialism or naturalism. And this teaches that the cosmos is God. Our world, ladies and gentlemen, is totally morally upside down. We preserve nature, but we abort babies. We have developed the technology to build strong, solid houses, but we have weak, sick homes. We are smarter now than we've ever been, but we are no wiser. We know more, but we understand less. We go faster, but we can't seem to get anywhere. 
We have conquered space, but our habits are still conquering us. We rescue whales and whooping cranes, but we neglect and abuse our own children and veterans. And we do it because all at the root of it is materialism and naturalism. When theologians or philosophers, both of them talk about materialism, they're referring to a belief system that claims that the material universe is all there is, that there's nothing beyond this. In other words, there's no unseen spiritual realm that lies beyond the physical world. Carl Sagan, again, one of the, considered one of the greatest scientists to have ever lived, said, by making a confident profession of materialism, he said these words. He says, the cosmos is there, all there is, ever is, ever was, and ever will be. And he was mocking God when he said it. Look at me. Look at my little beady eyes and bald head. If this is all there is, we are men most pitiful. But this philosophy is being shoved down your children's throats and teaching them that if they can get a Cadillac in a garage or an extra chicken in the pot, or they can travel to foreign places and see parts of the world that they have arrived in life, I'm telling you, we need to prepare them for a world that is beyond this one. I'm trying to rush. Here's another one. Postmodernism, also known as nihilism. Watch this. Watch the evolution. Now, whatever is God. Whatever is God. Postmodernism is generally characterized by two related assumptions. Here it is. Number one, it is impossible to know what is true. Because all truth is relative. And what they're teaching your kids is neither religion or science can even tell you what's real or what's right. Two decades ago, they espoused, hey, we need to look to the halls of religion to give, the, give us truth. Just a few, four or five years ago, with COVID, all I heard was follow the science. Well, now we neither follow religion nor science. Why is that? Because postmodernism, nihilism, says it's impossible for you to know what is true. So therefore, logic and reason, here's the second part of it, can only lead you to what is true. In other words, whatever's true for you is truth. But what's true for you might not be true for me. So therefore, the, the outtake of that, the child of that belief system, is moral relativism. So now, I'm having to deal with children dressing like animals, wanting to defecate in the floor of a classroom, and we actually have educated people who are fighting for that kind of stuff in school boards that we elected and put there. And it's time for the church of Jesus Christ to wake up and make a stand right now and do whatever we got to do to fight that junk. The American heritage defines nihilism in this way, an extreme form of skepticism that denies all existence. It's a doctrine holding that all values are baseless and that nothing can be known or communicated. It is a rejection of all distinctions in moral and religious value and willingness to repudiate all previous theories of morality and religious belief. So watch this now. Everything that we have ever believed, everything that humanity has ever learned, now for the last eight to 10,000 years of human history, all that's out the window because now nobody knows what's true. And postmodernism, nihilism, has so completely infused the world of academics and education. I, I sat on the board of two major universities. I oversee over 3,000 pastors in America. 
And can I tell you, pastors are now sitting around trying to figure out what to do because they don't even want to send their kids to a college anywhere in America because of this kind of stuff that's being taught to them. Number five, I'm almost done. New age monism, pantheism. Now everything is God. Look at the progression. You think culture doesn't matter? Everything is God. In one ditch, you have an atheistic worldview of humanism, naturalism, postmodernism, declaring that God does not exist, and if he does, he's not knowable. On the opposite side, in the other ditch, you find monism and pantheism. Monistic religions, philosophies, Hinduism, Buddhism, many other of the other current flavors of New Age mysticism asserts that God is in everything and that God is everything. All matter, energy, spirit, everything composed of elements. Last night, I went down to V. Paul's downtown and I ordered me some shrimp scampi and I'm hungry now thinking about it. <laughs> a little girl came to, came to wait on me. As soon as she walked to the table, the Holy Ghost spoke to me about her life. So I waited till the end of my dinner and I said to her, do you believe in God? She said, well, I don't know if you would call it God. She said, I believe in energy. I said, oh, you're monistic. She said, absolutely. She knew exactly what I was talking about. She's 25 years old. I said, well, since you're monistic and you believe that everything is God, that God is in everything and everything is in God, then you have to believe that God is in me. She said, of course. And I said, well, something started happening to me when I was 12 years old. God started showing me things about people. And from time to time, there's a gift that comes in my life. And I can tell you things about people. I said, I see a little girl standing to your right. She's four years old, and I see a little boy standing to your left. She's, he's one year old. And you have looked at these two children as a great mistake in your life because it set you back. And I said, you grew up hard, and out of that, you made some very, very bad decisions. Tears began to run down her face. Her name is Summer. I said, Summer, the Lord, the Lord, Jesus, wants me to tell you that your future can be better than your past. And you don't have to believe in energy. There is a God who sits on a throne in heaven who has a son named Jesus. And he sent me to Pensacola not to preach in a conference, but to sit in an Italian restaurant and introduce you to him. Tomorrow she's supposed to be here at church. What am I trying to tell you? I'm trying to tell you right now, we're facing the greatest cultural onslaught than we have ever seen in the history of our nation. And here's what I see in the church. Retreat and circle the wagons. Get tied up in our four walls, do what we gotta do and hunker down till Jesus, uh, Jesus comes. But this retreat and circle the wagons approach is impossible to reconcile with the revealed word of God and the heart of God and the plan of Jesus and the providence of God in, in his affairs in mankind. Yet, I preach in a hundred churches a year. I can tell you that out of a hundred, there might be 10, maybe 15, where I have not seen this Retreat mentality. I want you to hear something tonight. I refuse to participate in retreat. I will, as a Christian, impose a kingdom occupation on the culture in which I live. Do I have anybody in Pace, Florida, who'll say, I will be the hammer of my generation and make a stand for Jesus? For far too long, we have surrendered our great universities. 
the historic talent pools and recruiting grounds for our nation's CEOs and ambassadors and senators and even our presidents. We, the church, have abandoned vast stretches of the fields of art and humanities. We have retreated and give up degrees in realms of science and business and media. So what is the answer? Throw in the towel? No. The answer, my friend, is to occupy until he comes. <laughs> Victory will not come if we remain sheltered behind four walls in the sanctuary of our churches. We must be prepared to confront the false worldviews in every single sphere of human activity and make a compelling argument for the truth of our biblical worldview. You're going to have to learn the culture that you're in. Figure out how to speak their language and make a stand with the gospel. We have to invade every sphere. I'm done. We have to invade every sphere. We have to occupy till he comes in your home, which means you might have to turn some of that junk off your social media platforms. Get it out of the eyes of your children. Occupy till he comes. Occupy the arenas of religion. Occupy the arenas of education. We need Holy Ghost field teachers to invade public school systems and occupy till Jesus comes. I need somebody who will come up as a media mogul filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost to work in the media world and not cower down when they finally get their platform. We need to occupy till he comes in arts and entertainment. Listen to me, I'm tired of seeing all of our young men and young women that sing on the platform of our churches. We make them the great musicians. And then they go and the world steals them and puts them on a platform and destroys their life and millions of others with them. It's time for us to occupy. The greatest artists and entertainers and musicians in the world need to come out of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ and make a stand for him. Occupy in the arena of sports. Occupy in commerce and science and technology. Occupy in government. And occupy in politics. You and I are on a divine assignment. I want to give it to you in Ephesians chapter 3 as I close. Paul said, make all men see. What is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the ages was hidden, be, been hidden in God who created all things through Jesus Christ? Look now, look at these words, to the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and the powers in the heavenly places. We quote it all the time, but it's time to start living this. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in this world. Come on, say that out loud with me, please. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in this world. I'm challenging you today. Be a hammer. Stop being Hellenized or conformed to every swing in the culture. Be a counterculture Christian. Swim upstream. You'll be shocked at who notices if you'll swim upstream. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for your word today. I thank you for these great men of God here today that have opened this platform. You can't do this everywhere. Give us courage to face our culture with the good news that there's only one way to heaven. One mediator between God and man. That is the man Christ Jesus. Help us to occupy till you come in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to take you right now on a whirlwind tour. 
It's going to be pretty intense. A blessing of a nation. Uh, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. Now, the reverse of that would be cursed is the nation whose God is not the Lord. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. When the foundations are being destroyed, what can the righteous do? When we just heard that last talk from Pastor Shane, when the foundations are being destroyed, what can the righteous do? He gave a strategy. There's another way of understanding this from the Hebrew in terms of a rendition of this text, a possibility. And I like the second one better. When the foundations are being destroyed, what is the righteous one, capital R, capital O, doing? When we see this happening, what's God up to? What's he, he, what's he telling us? Uh, you, you have the most incredible opportunity you've ever had. After the, when you watch the debates, I, I, I attended the RNC, the Republican National Convention, my eighth one to go to. But when you hear all the discussions going on there, you hear the debates, uh, to take your children through the, all the issues, or your grandchildren, sit with them and talk about it. If you don't remember all the issues, this encyclopedia so you can read anywhere. You have the opportunities to make the case for the Word of God to your neighbors. His, his, his emphasis was don't retreat, advance. This is an opportunity for advancement. The reason this conference is not so we hide. The reason for this conference is so we go into all the world. Now, some pastors, apparently their Bible reads, go into all the world except politics. Go into all the world except government. Run from that, they say. They say, well, uh, Jim, I don't preach politics like you. I, don't, I just preach Jesus. I said, really? So do I. Almost every time I've ever spoken, I give an invitation to receive Christ as Savior. But I not only preach what Jesus, I not only preach Jesus, I preach what Jesus preached. What did he preach? The kingdom. What does a kingdom have? A king. What is a king over? Everything. Jesus is over everything, including the political realm. So consequently, I focus on that. Our ministry that my wife and I have is called Well Verse. And so I'm going to take you on a whirlwind uh, through a, a quite a number of nations. This is a book. If you want this one, you can, avail, you can go to wellversedworld.org. This covers 30 political topics. It's part one of this. This is part two. Reverse is part two, a much larger book. But it's available as, as well. But I want to take you, I'm going to run through a bunch of slides here very, very quickly, if I can, because I'm going to take you on a tour of the world. And I apologize for skipping over some slides, but I want to be sensitive to the, the time frame that we're in right now. I'm going to take you, first of all, to this country. I'm going to take you to a number of countries right now. So bear with me as we go. This first country is going to be Egypt. I, a group of us had the privilege, I had the privilege of meeting with some heads of state. This doesn't happen often. It's very, very difficult to get meetings with heads of state. I don't have those kind of connections or clout, but fortunately I have some friends who do. So whenever I can and I can prevail on them, they help get me. This is, this is to the, with President Al-Sisi of Egypt, a small delegation. First time he ever met with evangelicals. Now, he's Muslim, of course, as you would expect, but he is standing strongly against the Muslim Brotherhood, doing some good things. But what I want you to see is from Psalm 2, why do the nations rage? Why do the nations rage? And why are we seeing an alignment happening against Israel? We're moving towards something. This movement against Israel is cropping up. You, you can go to any country of the world and find university students who are pro-Hamas, not just, not just the United States. So what is going on here as we enter into these days? And I want you to be aware, I'm gonna just drop in occasionally the understanding of the nature of, as, as it relates towards Israel. Uh, he, he, the President of Sisi is one who has my admiration. He's doing, in a really tough situation, actually a rather remarkable job. But the evangelicals there, the evangelicals, who are from Cairo to Tel Aviv would be a short plane ride and could go visit what you long to visit in Israel. Don't go there because of anti-Semitism. Some have privately confided with me, confided in me that no, I'd like to go, but I don't dare go because if I would look like I was pro-Israel or pro-Jewish, it, it would be a travesty. Let me take you to another country. We're now in, in with the Kurds, the leader of uh, Kurdistan. Now, Kurdistan is, is, is kind of not a, it's not a country. It's a country within some countries. It, it's a, the Kurdistan, the Kurds live within four, spread across four nations. They need their own nation. I, I, I wish they could get their own nation. These are Muslims, but these are unusual Muslims. These particular Muslims happen to love America and highly respect Donald Trump. They love Netanyahu and they love Israel. Why? 
they respect Israel. They said, Israel, you Jews got your nation. It took you 2,000 years to get it back, but you got it. We want to do what you did and get our own nation somehow. They're, they're persecuted severely by, by other people around them at the same time. I take you a short distance away. Now we're in Jordan. We're at the, the palace of the king, King Abdullah II. He has, whereas they were at war with Israel, as you know, they have very good relationship. He respects Netanyahu. They respect each other uh, uh, quite highly. But among evangelicals in that country, it's primarily a Muslim country, but among the evangelicals, I'm going to give a quote from a very high-level evangelical. He said, if the evangelical pastors here could do it, they would take a razor and cut the word Israel out of every place it appears in their Bible. This is the tragedy of anti-Semitism, even among people who say they're followers of Yeshua. Mike Evans wrote a book called Jew Hatred in the Church. I got to whatever chapter it was when I was talking about the persecution, the actual physical persecution of what people in the name of Christ had done to, to the Jewish people. It was so painful to read. I had to stop. I could, not, I could not finish the chapter, and I never finished the book. It was too hard to take to think that people who claimed to be followers of Jesus would ever treat the Jewish people in this way. Let's talk a little bit about Netanyahu, if we can. We've had the, this is my wife, Rosemary, with me here in this picture. I've had the privilege of meeting with him three times. One was brief, one was highly scripted, and another one was wide open, long, and we could ask anything we wanted and enjoyed it immensely. This is a man who's under the horrific, horrific pressure and deserves our prayers and to stand with him. Now, no leader is perfect. I've had the privilege of meeting with lots of members of parliament across Europe. We, we've been, last year, we had 15 countries, members of parliament. We'll be back over there soon. We've made, I, 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 I think, eight trips across the Atlantic and four across the Pacific in the last four months. We've had the privilege of meeting with some of these people. And, and none of the leaders are perfect. We're all, we're all imperfect. So I'm not lifting someone else up like they're godlike. But Netanyahu has been a phenomenal leader. And, and when you hear the riots in the streets, that is cultivated by radical leftists who really at their core do not appreciate Israel's mission. When you hear him trying to reform the Supreme Court, it's because it's a self-perpetuating Supreme Court by the power they have. It's not good. It's very bad. Their rulings have been terrible in terms of the Jewish people themselves in that country. And we were just there 21 days in May and in part of June. And we were there, we met with President Herzog just very briefly, had the privilege of meeting. And I had the privilege of telling him this I, I said, I'm an extrovert, so I just struck up conversations with hundreds of Israelis on this trip, more than I probably ever have. Some were in the military, shopkeepers, people on this street. I, I just stopped everybody. And it was easy to do because there were no tourists there. Tourists don't go, we're going back next month. My wife, my wife is fearless. Rosemary's fearless. She's not afraid of anything. So we keep going to Israel during wars, no matter what. I said, you think maybe we, maybe we ought to stay home? And nope, we're going. Okay, we're going. And she's just not the least bit afraid of it. And God just protects us. And so we're going again next, next month. Uh, and and as, as we toured around, there were, there were you know, 4 million tourists a year, but there were, there were none. So we had interaction with the Israeli people. And so I brought up overwhelm. I said, I want you to know something. We stand in solid, rock solid support with you. I said, evangelicals, I'm part of the evangelical Christian, maybe 60 million in the U.S., and probably around somewhere 85% of us are rock-solid support of you. And, and 60% approximately of the people I said this to, they started crying. Tears started. And they, almost every single one of them said, we feel so alone. And that's the report I'm giving you from some of the countries to show you what's happening. While we were there in Israel, Spain turned against them. Ireland turned against them. Norway turned against them. Just before we went, the International Court of, of Justice and the International Criminal Court, both in The Hague and the Netherlands, 
ruled them genocidal, calling Netanyahu. If he travels to one of the countries where the ICC is connected, he can be arrested and thrown in prison right now. We were just in the Netherlands at The Hague, objecting to the International Court of Justice. Well, there are 15 justices. We thought the ruling would be 14 to 1 against Israel. We actually rejoiced it was 11 to 4. Still terrible. It was awful. But we were so happy that four of them actually ruled in favor of Israel. We only expected one. We, we went to an event there, then we all marched. There were 48 nations, 800 of us, and we signed a document. It was literally sealed in wax, like the old document. And a group of us, of 50 of us, went unannounced to the International Court of Justice and insisted on seeing and, and depositing this document. And, and our final word was, you, we're warning you as justices, we're warning you, you go against Israel, you're gonna bring travesty upon yourself. It's going to hurt you. Don't do this. We're coming redemptively for your case. Don't do this yourself. But I told President Herzog, this was in the end of May, this picture. I said, we stand with you. And he says, he, 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 they are so appreciative of those. They feel so alone right now. Taking you to another country. Now we're at Honduras. This is President Hernandez. Since this picture was taken, he's been convicted and he's in prison. I don't know if the charges are for real. I'm not sure. Uh, but it, it's not a good thing. Those who followed him, it's not a good situation. They've recalled their ambassador uh, from Israel. It's a nation turning against Israel now. I take you to Brazil right now. Here we are with Bolsonaro, Jairo Bolsonaro, a really godly leader, a Catholic man who's married to an evangelical. He hungers to do what is right. He was the president and he's, he's wearing a, a, a prayer shawl that was given to him by one of my friends in that meeting. He boldly wore we, we didn't take any, we didn't post any pictures. We snuck out past reporters to make sure that we didn't want to bring embarrassment by him meeting with evangelicals from America. Uh, but he immediately posted this picture and had 364,000 responses positive to it, immediately shares and stuff. He's a man who's willing to stand for the truth. We were with him right as he was being, before he was being sworn in. He had been stabbed as he ran for office, you remember. He went through a lot of surgeries. Even after this picture, he was going back in for another surgery for the harm that, that had happened to him. Next time I was with him, the following time, I went up to him and, and we prayed over him and thanked him. He didn't say anything for a long time to a small group of us meeting with him. And when he finally spoke up, he simply said, the cross is heavy. He promised to move the embassy. He desired to move the embassy. The pressures on him were enormous. He did not move the embassy. Tragically, in what seems to me to be a, a, a fraudulent election, Lulu, who was a convicted criminal, was reelected, is there, and now they're trying to do to him what they've been trying to do to Trump. He was called the Trump uh, of the tropics, and they've removed their ambassador, as I understand it, from Israel under the current leadership, which is really tragic because as goes Brazil, that's, that's about half of South America, as you may know. I take you to another country. I'm taking you now to Guatemala. In this picture, we're meeting with President Jimmy Morales. This was a guy who was a comedian who got elected to office. And his background is kind of like Trump's. It wasn't like he was Mother Teresa in his previous life, but he knew what was right, and he circled himself with evangelical pastors to guide him and make decisions. A, was a wise man and gave good leadership. The, uh, this, the irony of this story is he went to inform Netanyahu he would not move the embassy. And you understand moving the embassy from Tel Aviv to, to Jerusalem. Jerusalem. Israel is the only country where they don't let their own country decide where their capital is. Every other, every other nation, you put the embassies in the capital. But they refuse to do that because that's a way of, once they move it to Jerusalem, it's an acknowledgement that Jerusalem is the, important phrases, indefensible and eternal capital of the Jewish people. And, and to, to kind of acquiesce towards the Muslim, Palestinian, Arabs that are there, uh, they, they, they don't want to do that. And so Donald Trump, every president had promised to do it, as you know. Trump was the only president of all the recent presidents who honored his word. They all said they would move the embassy. They all refused to honor their word. He moved the embassy. He was warned, you know, we'll start World War III. It wasn't. We were there. We attended the ceremonies ourselves. People were dancing in the street for joy. It was no World War III. 
that started. The, country, the second country to move their embassy was Guatemala. Now, they were the second country to recognize Israel back on May the 14th, 1948, when Israel became a nation at midnight that night, when Ben-Gurion declared them an independent state after the British mandate had now formally ended at midnight. And the first person to ever declare support of that, as you know, was Truman. It was 6.11 p.m. on the East Coast when he says, I support you. And when he took that action and supported Israel, uh, then Guatemala, back in 1948, was the second nation to affirm Guatemala. Well, they moved their embassy immediately following the U.S. And a year later, we were back in, uh, in, in Israel with the first lady, uh, Mrs. Morales, and she reported how the GDP of Guatemala had almost doubled the blessing of the Lord for them honoring Israel in that particular way. Following President Jimmy Morales was Alejandro uh, John Matei. Now, he is not one of us. I'll just stop with that. He's not one of us. However, he so believed in the, in the truth of Scripture, even though he was not a carrier of it, he surrounded himself with godly counselors and made right decisions. He stood against the onslaught. If you go, if you go to one of these small countries, this U.S. State Department, which has been corrupted since at least 1940, our U.S. State Department coerces these nations to fly the rainbow flag by theirs. They coerce transgenderism. My wife and I were at a conference in Paris on marriage, and the Arab, the African delegates said, you are trying to colonize us again. I said, what are you talking about? They said, you colonized us once, but now you're sexually colonizing it. By you, they met America, and at that time Obama was the president, said they're forcing us to affirm same-sex marriage and transgenderism. We want nothing to do with that. I said to the president, uh, Jean Matei, I says, when the, when the vice president comes, Kamala Harris, when she comes, when she was just ready to come, do not acquiesce to her demands. He said through a translator, be assured we will not. And, and, and even though he would not be considered, we would not be a part of the kingdom in the way we define that, he's a man who's convinced that there's wisdom in surrounding himself with godly counselors, and he did a lot of things right during that time. They have a new president right now, and tragically, it's not, it's not the same story that we're seeing now. The new president, Aravella, I've never met with him. Uh, I, I, he's the president now. His dad was the first president democratically elected in Guatemala. His dad was also an ambassador to Israel. So this young man grew up in Israel. He speaks Hebrew, but unfortunately, he's now chastising Israel uh, for, for the war, and I'm deeply concerned. We're talking about sheep, goat nations. You understand the difference, right? Those who honor Israel and those who don't. And I'm concerned. Guatemala is the country that provided us the, the workers for Wycliffe Bible Translators, started there. Uh, Cam Townsend started there. It has so much godliness in it. And when they turn against Israel, then they bring destruction upon themselves. Who well, you're looking at the screen now is Janine Agnes. At the time this picture was taken, my wife and I were with her. She was the president of Bolivia. In November of 2019, there was an uprising in Bolivia against a Morales, not related to the other Morales I mentioned, who was the dictator, a socialist dictator. He was, out, he was overstaying his elected term. And there was a rising up of a prayer meeting in the street. It started with a dozen people. Pretty soon it was a million and a half. Pretty soon the police, instead of stopping them, the police joined them and started kneeling and crying out for God. And a man named Camacho, Camacho Ferrara, um, uh, he, he decided he was going to go uh, up and, and meet with the dictator and go with a Bible in one hand and a signing of the document in the other hand to resign. His father pled with him, don't go from, from Santa Cruz up to La Paz. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's 13,000 feet in altitude. It's way high. He said, don't go up there. They'll kill you. He says, I'm going anyway, uh, this man did, Fernando Camacho. And so he did go up there. But instead of being killed, the dictator fled. And, and with him went his number one guy, number two, number three, number four, number five. And so the presidency fell in succession to the sixth in line. And it was Janine Agnes, a senator, and she suddenly became president. 
She was a good godly woman, but she was in a very unfortunate political party that wasn't very, very good. Her brother was an evangelical pastor, and she was trying to do what's right. But the socialists came back into power, threw her in prison. She's in prison right now. And I learned when I was just there recently that, that even the, the length of the prison term is not known. Camacho's in prison. Uh, I'm deeply concerned about these people. I've tried to get an international spotlight on this situation. She almost died in prison. Uh, she looks wonderful in this picture. The pictures of her and what she's looking like now. I've been in communication with her kids. And I pray for Janine and yes, that she gets miraculously set free from this prison. Now with, with Ars, Ars is his name, the new president, he hates Israel and he's standing against Israel, a nation, a wonder, otherwise wonderful nation that is now taking the risk of going against God's ways. Victor Orban, we take you to Hungary. I've never talked with Victor Orban personally, but I've been in Budapest a number of times where he's spoken in small venues. The man in the upper left-hand corner, Tristan Asbez, is a friend of mine. He's the state secretary, not secretary of state, but state secretary. It's almost like a cabinet position. But I want you to see how Hungary stands alone, almost alone. There might be two other nations sort of with them. In the European Union, it's a very, very difficult walk. And then the European Council, which is much larger, the European Union, which is newer and smaller, how difficult it is. He is constantly harassed because he stands for Christian values and says we are a Christian nation, period. <clears throat> We're not going to let Muslims come in and destroy our Christian nation. He gets tremendous hatred from European Union for that. He is detested for that. Tristan Asbez, who is the state secretary, he has the assignment, now catch this, his assignment is find Christians where they're being persecuted and save them. There's only nine million people in all of Hungary, and they're going over the world trying to save the Christians they're being persecuted. Just so you all know, 80% of the world's population is religiously persecuted. 80% of those are Christians. So he has a very difficult, challenging task. They are so pro-family, pro they're standing against the onslaught of homosexuality and transgenderism. So they say, get married and then have babies in that order. If you will get married and have babies, if you'll have two babies, we'll cancel half your student debt. If you'll have three babies, we'll cancel all your student debt. If you'll have four babies, we'll can't, you don't have to pay income tax the rest of your life. If you have babies, we'll help you buy a car, a van, if you'll fill it with babies. We'll help you buy a house if you'll fill it with babies. They're coming against the demographic winter that is happening all over Europe where the birth rate has to be, the fertility rate needs to be 2.1 to sustain it. And where it's happening in Europe, it's 1.4, 1.6, 1.5. Disaster of demographic winter. I just got back from Japan a few days ago. It's 1.3 there. It is in a crisis. It, can't, it probably cannot be turned in Japan. It probably can in most across Western, Western Europe. U.S. has fallen to 1.9. That is not a good thing. But this is a man who stands. Tremendous persecution this guy is under. And you'll hear, oh, he's a dictator. No, he's giving good godly leadership. I would contend the closest to godly leadership we find. I served on President Trump's faith advisory board during the campaign of 2016, during the four years he was in office in the 2020 campaign as well. This is a man who, Mike Huckabee says this way, most people are, are nice in public and they're mean in private. He says, Donald Trump gets it the other way around. <laughs> and, but we, we, I've been with him about seven or eight times and, and, and Pastor Shane has been with him as well. He is very attentive. He listens. He, 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 he's a very good listener. I was in one time we were there, about 85 of us, most of us were preachers. He talked, there were four people, five people who asked to talk for a minute each and they sat down. He says, well, there's a lot of preachers here. You always have something on your mind, I'll bet. So I'll turn the microphone over to you. Who would turn the microphone over to 85 preachers? But he took that risk. And the preacher shockingly stayed one minute uh, each. I mean, with no, no timekeeper, it was, it was really quite amazing. But he's very quick to listen. He's a good and in, incredible listener. This is in Albania. Albania, uh, the, the, across much of Europe, I've met with a lot of ex-prime ministers because the ex-prime ministers, the good, ones, the good ones are out and a lot of the bad ones are in, unfortunately. In Albania's recent elections, 90% of their mayors are now, are now socialists. This came out of communism and now is, is going in some, some, some difficult directions. So these are some of the former prime ministers we met with in that particular country and, and some members of parliament there. Uh, this is a country that's kind of interesting. It's the only uh, country in Europe that after the World War, it wouldn't release any of the Jews 
to the Nazis. And after the war was over, they actually had more Jews after the war than there were Jews before the war started. And they also, um, it's one of the only Muslim countries that honors the actual bona fide accepted definition of anti-Semitism, which is a great tribute to, to, to this country. It's trying to align itself as a sheep nation, I hope and I pray. We're, we're now in, in Romania. I had the privilege of speaking there for the parliament, for some members of the parliament. And this is a country, it's the only country of all the ones that threw off communism where it was, it was bloody. Ceausescu, you may remember, in December, under this Christmas of 1989, was, was killed. And the, quite a celebration in the streets when they finally overthrew. The biggest building in the world outside the Pentagon is their capital building. It is massive for this country, built by slaves, slave labor. Uh, Ceausescu demanded it be built, and he only got to see one room completed of it before he was finally driven for power, and thank goodness. Um, this, is, this is the country, the only communist country that kept it, maintained its relationships with Israel through the entire uh, communist regime. Uh, and, and so I'm very hopeful of what, and I think their leadership were the first ones to go visit Israel after October 7th e event. So I hope, hope for Romania. Latvia is not well known by most of you, so I put it on the map. And here's an uh, example of the lady in the uh, yellow colored suit. She was a former minister uh, of their parliament. Her husband, uh, to her right, is a member of the parliament. Her son's a member of the parliament. Her husband's a former minister of transportation. This, this, this is a country who, like many of the countries, um, it, it, their, their national anthem is a prayer, a prayer to Almighty God. Uh, but they've, they're the first country that's elected in Europe a person who, before he was elected, it was already known he was openly homosexual. Right now, they're in, in good stead with Israel, but when they start violating Scripture in one area, they start violating the Scripture in the other. Show me where a person stands on abortion, and I'll tell you with a 95-degree accuracy where they stand on about everything else. I'm concerned for this country. Here we are with Prince uh, Nicholas and uh, Princess Margarita of, of Liechtenstein. Now, they don't have formal relations with other countries except for Switzerland, but they do have formal relations with the country of Israel. I asked the, the prince, What's, how should I pray for Liechtenstein, this little tiny area? He says, pray that they would know Christ. It's a good thing to say. Uh, here we are. This is, this is taken just a few days ago, maybe two weeks ago in Japan. Um, when the war was over, World War II was over, the emperor said to General MacArthur, he says, our God is not true, your God is true. I'm gonna declare our nation a Christian nation. MacArthur says, don't do that, because coming into Christianity is voluntary and individual. Now, that's a true statement, what MacArthur said, but I don't think he understood what missiologists understand about Eastern culture. I'm not sure if he gave, he gave the best advice uh, but whatever happened, MacArthur did say, flood this country with at least 10,000 missionaries fast. They're ready to receive it. And no, we did not. And so the result today of the population, world's biggest city in population is Tokyo with 37 million. The population, because demographic winter is plummeting, it was 125 million in Japan. It's now down to 120 and it's dropping rapidly. This country is in real trouble demographically. Of the 750, uh, 700 or so members of the parliament, they have bicameral house as well. About uh, three of them are Christian. Repeat that. Of 700 and some in Congress, three are Christian in this country. This is one of them. He's a pastor who loves God, and it's a very difficult, it's a very, very difficult challenge. Now, the good news is they have good relations with Israel at this point. We pray it continues. 80% are Buddhist, but also 80% say they're also Shintoist. They're the kind of a combination of Buddhism and Shintoism. And even sometimes when they come to Christianity, they sort of drag their Buddhism with them in a, in a, in a way. And so it's a difficult country. There's only 1 million probably true Jesus followers uh, out of the 120 million in the country. I sat with another senator whose picture I won't show. Uh, he, he's, he's a Buddhist, but I won't, I won't reference his name. And I says, I want to talk to you about your demographic winter. You're losing population severely, and you're in, you're in a crisis. He says, oh, yes, we are. It's very serious. I says, can you make a connection between the reality that abortion is widespread in this country and you're losing population? He said, no, there's no connection. 
So I repeated myself. He said, no. So I took a little bit more and went into kind of the numbers. And he says, no, he could not connect the reality between a plummeting population and killing babies in the womb. Uh, this nation so far is supporting Israel, staying with Israel. Uh, we continue to pray that it do exactly that. We're now with the president of Armenia. This was about five weeks, maybe six weeks ago. Armenia is in a terrific crisis. This is the complexities of geopolitical. Here's Armenia, and over here is Azerbaijan. Azerbaijan's been around since 1918. Armenia's been around here since 3,000 years. Azerbaijan is claiming all of their land, just like the Palestinians claim the Jewish land. That's exactly what's going on here, and they're killing the Armenians. The Armenians had a horrific genocide, as you know, from 1915 to 1917. Some of it was before, some of it was after that, but most of it in those two years, they came in and literally just gunned down a million and a half now of the, of the Armenians. And the good news is the, the, the Christians in America did rise up and, and, and did some tremendous help during that time, took care of tens of thousands of orphans and did a lot to try to mitigate the horrific damage that had been done by the Turks as they came in, just shot people, massive numbers in that the genocide, and they still don't admit it's an actual genocide. But to some measure, it's occurring again. Artsakh on the east, 120,000 have been starved, and they would try to escape. They would, they would, as they tried to escape, they would shoot their dogs. They would steal the stuff from their cars. They, they would do anything, the Azerbaijanis, against them. And so it's a tough situation, but here it gets more complex. Azerbaijan has a good relationship with Israel. They have good relations because Israel's trying to keep Azerbaijan from being related to Iran. Iran is the big evil, we understand that. And so they have a relationship and they need the oil from Azerbaijan. So Israel has a good relationship with Azerbaijan, so getting the oil, they give them drones. The tragedy is those drones are going over and killing the Christians in Armenia. Armenia was the first country to ever declare itself Christian. The year was 301 AD. A man named Gregory in, in about 290 AD came over, he came over from um, another country because his father had killed the, the king's father and he came to ask forgiveness. And when he got to the king, he said, I came to ask forgiveness from my dad did to your dad. And he was, they threw him in a prison and kept him there in a pit in the ground. You can just go and see that pit today. And he was there for 13 years until the king got sick. And the daughter says, hey, there's that guy in that pit. Maybe he could help you. He came up, prayed over me, got healed. He says, that's it. Your God's the right one. I'm declaring Armenia a Christian country. And to this day, and we met with the president, we met with deputies, we met with governors, we met with mayors. Every single one of them said, we are a Christian nation. Now, I recognize not all of them have a Christian born again experience. I understand that. But they are proud of the fact our values are distinctly Christian. And we don't want anything but I wish I had time to tell you some of the stunning stories about the situation. And here's... Azerbaijan getting drones from Israel that's being used to kill the Christian Armenians. And in here is, is they're right above Iran. They've got a tough neighborhood. They've got Turkey. They've got Azerbaijan. They've got Iran right below them. And they need, they need the, uh, uh, the, the gas from there and they've got electricity to sell. So they're in relationship with Iran. They don't want to be. They want to be in relationship actually with Israel. While I was talking to the president, I stood up, I said, see right here, that's the flag of Israel and the U.S., and I said, I want to walk you through something because the, the word is that they were buying into the two-state solution myth. And I says, I want you to know God promised Israel from the Euphrates to the Nile, that's 300,000 square miles. David, under King David, they only were able to get uh, 200,000 of those square miles. So they didn't get near all of it. And now I said, do you know how much Israel has now? They don't have 200,000. They don't have 300,000 of what God promised. They have 8,100 square miles. And I pray someday they'll have, now I was beaming a message to him. I says, what I want is another pin on here of, of Israel and, and, and I want the U.S. And, and Armenia and Israel and Armenia. I'd like to have pins like that. They went and got me one right away that had one of the U.S. and Armenia flags flying together. And he, he was, well, they, they actually have high regard for Israel. They love Israel, but they're trapped in a neighborhood where it's extremely difficult. Pray for Armenia. The Armenian Christians right now, they are suffering uh, severely, and there's a, there's a threat of complete destruction and annihilation. <clears throat> now we're, my wife gathers all these flags, and she likes to bring them to Israel. We're in the Knesset. 
Well, some of these are two members of the Knesset. There are, many of you probably know them. Yehuda, Glick, and Ohatal. Victor would know them well. They're just special brothers of us. And she likes to bring all the nation's flags here in their prayed plate. I want you to remember this picture because I'm going to talk about the pandemic treaty and World Health Organization a little bit. We were, we were there protesting what the World Health Organization is just about to do uh, to, the, to the whole globe, quite candidly. And this is the International Court of Justice where we were for what was called the trial, where we tried to warn the justices at The Hague and the Netherlands, don't do what you're about to do. This is an international criminal court, which Trump took us out of. We're not members of that, fortunately, and we, and we should not be. Now we're at the United Nations and Dag Hammarskjöld. He's a man who said, we, we can't get mankind to heaven through this place, but maybe we can keep mankind from creating hell on earth. He actually was a Christian. He wouldn't use the language we would use as evangelical Christians, but he's a man who had a deep faith from his mother, and uh, he was the youngest man ever to be uh, the head of uh, uh, the Secretary General of the United Nations. His book, book Markings, or it was his journal. He died at a very young age. He became uh, head of this at the age of like 43, the youngest ever in 1953. He died in a plane crash. I want you to see some things at the United Nations because it's not a place that we have confidence in spiritually, and we understand that. But here is, as you go to walk in the United Nations, if you turn to your left before you go in and by the East River, we, we had a ministry there. We had a Bible study there up till COVID. COVID shut things down. They were closed for like three years. But we had a, a ministry there, and we met privately with about 93 of the 193 ambassadors there. Yeah, but there's this really quite remarkable statue, and it's beating the sword into plowshare, quoting Isaiah 2 and, and Micah 4. It, it's a, what's interesting about this, it says we will study war no more, and we'll have peace. Now, it's in front of the United Nations. The implication, the United Nations is the place that can bring world peace, which it can't. But that passage in Isaiah 2 is talking about the Messianic era. When Jesus returns, we're going to have peace. We'll have war no more. Now, here's the irony. That was, I want to show you something. This was given to the United Nations by an atheist nation. An atheist nation gave a statue from Scripture telling that Jesus is going to be the one to bring peace, not the United Nations. You know what that nation was? The USSR. An atheist nation, USSR, gave a statue of Scripture proclaiming that Jesus is the only answer. And that scripture says, the time will come, we're going to flow up. You think of rivers flowing down. We're going to flow up to Zion and the word of the Lord, the law, the Torah, the teaching, there's where our truth is going to come from, not the United Nations. That's right in front of the United Nations. Unless you think that's an oddity, let me go back. Let me go back just to a first avenue across the street. Here's the Isaiah wall, the same scripture. The United Nations is parametered with scriptures saying it doesn't have the answer, Jesus does, the Messiah. Now, how would that be? Because God is so pervasive, even in that place. I've met with people who are Christians who work there who don't know what I'm now telling you. I was taught this by a guy who did work there. He took me on a tour. I said, I can't believe this. This is a spiritual heritage tour. And then here is right out in front, this is called good versus evil, given by Russia again, the Soviet Union. And good versus evil. Now, it looks like St. Michael, and it looks like the, the, in, the, in the book of Revelation, it's actually from St. George, but a godly man, St. George, <clears throat> in Russian history. And he's over the dragon, slaying the dragon. Good versus evil. The implication is there is good and there is evil. Objective truth that, that the pastor was talking about before I came up here. And now I take you into the security room, which is probably the security chamber, which is probably the most important room there. And there on the wall is this enormous kind of a tapestry, on this enormous tapestry that in this, in this country, I mean, this building that's now controlled to a large extent by homosexual interests and LBGTQ, here is this incredible mural that the rising from the ashes after World War II in the Phoenix is a, the nuclear family of a father, a mother being married and the offspring that will come from that marriage. And if I take you to the wallpaper of that room, faith, hope, and love, 1 Corinthians 13, 13. The, the faith is demonstrated by the anchor. Hope is by the head of wheat. Love is by the heart. The wallpaper declares 1 Corinthians 13. 
And here's another story. This is one of the statues from Nagasaki. Uh, the, when, they, when the bomb was dropped, unfortunately, Nagasaki was, was, had the highest Christian population, and the bomb was dropped from right over one of the, the largest churches in the Orient at the time, a uh, cathedral, and St. Agnes, um, they have it there in the United Nations because it shows the scarring on the backside of this from the power of an atomic bomb. But she is from the 290s, as she was a famous saint from 290s, who was known for, I don't have time to tell you the story, it's just breathtaking. She was known for her purity and honoring of the Lord. And here that sits in the United Nations at this time. Here is a special prayer chamber. Here's some of us praying there. We hired Michelle Bachman after she left Congress. She became an employee of us for the first year to open up our ministry in the United Nations and that's her praying there. As you walk into the building, to your right is the Mark Chagall window. It's based on Isaiah 9, 6. The government will be on his shoulder. This is a scripture from the teach the Sermon on the Mount. Do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. That's in the United, Jesus is quoted in, in, in the United Nations. And then here's the interest to the United Nations on First Avenue, Raul Wallenberg. This is a country, this is, the nation is now voting, United Nations, when they vote, they vote against Israel like 156 to six. Almost all the resolutions are against Israel. Not North Korea, not Iran, not Russia, not China. The human rights abuses, they charge against, against Israel constantly. The votes are terrible. And yet God ordained the United Nations to come back into existence in mid-1945 so that in 1947, October the 29th, it would vote to reestablish the nation of Israel. It voted 33, yes, 13 no, 10 abstentions, and Israel was established that moment in the modern state of Israel. Out front is the, is, is a, is the wall, Raul Wallenberg walkway and this memorial. It's a strange one. These towers means lives that have been cut off. That's what they represent. You can't see it probably well in the picture, but there, well, you can barely see it. There's a briefcase there as a part of the memorial, and that, that briefcase represents work undone. Somebody left hurriedly. Those pavers come from Budapest, Hungary, where Raul Wallenberg, a Swedish diplomat, saved the lives of 100,000 Jews by racing as fast as he could to his, he put them in safe houses so they'd be technically in Sweden, even though they were in Budapest, as, the, as, you, as they were, the Jews were being killed and hauled away. Put them in like 28 or 30 houses that he owned, that he bought. I mean, the Swedish government owned it. So that was considered part of Sweden and was stamped passports as fast as he possibly could. Saved the lives of 100,000. Since he stood against the Nazis, he thought he could stand against Russia when they came in. Russia came in hauled him away, put him in a gulag, and tortured him for the next, we don't know how long, 20, 25 years, don't know when he died, think maybe 1973. They tried and tried and tried to find him. The Russians tortured him and killed him. If you'll just Google Raul Wallenberg, look at the institutions around the world that are named for that. Now, that's in front, directly in front of the United Nations. God is so pervasive that even in this anti-Semitic, anti-Christian entity now, God used it in some really amazing ways. Now, as we go around the globe, we run into one common thing, the anti-Semitism rising, and I want you to see one more thing, an attack on marriage. I gotta go, do I have just a few more minutes? I'm so sorry to, okay, I, I gotta drag you through. This is the best of the best right now coming up. So if I can just go a few more, thank you, Pastor, for allowing me, like you're gonna say no to me and ask in front of anybody, okay. The pastor said no to me, folks, sorry. No. <laughs> There is, there is an attack on marriage everywhere we go. You can't go anywhere. People will come to a country and they'll say, you won't believe what's happening here. And they, I say, yes, yes, believe me, I know. I just saw it in the last 10 countries I was in. Why the attack on marriage? Let me ask you a question real quick here. Is, is God male or female? Well, neither. Uh, God is not something androgynous either. When we talk about the image of God, the, the, the writers in the scripture have a hard time describing God because they, 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 they use depictions of his strong might and they'll use masculine depictions. But other writers in the Tanakh, they'll write of his tenderness, his nurturing. They'll write of, Jesus, uh, of, of God having a womb that gives birth, breasts that feeds a newborn baby. So 
whatever God is, the full image of God, no male by himself is a representation of the full spectrum of the image of God. You follow me? No woman by herself is a full spectrum of the image of God. It's only as the two complementary halves of humanity come together in the covenant, covenant, covenant of marriage, they become a representation of the full spectrum of the image of God. So let's take a look at this. Now I'm going to back up a little bit more here. Some of the, some of the words we even give, the El Shaddai, El, mighty. Shaddai, nurse, the, uh, the uh, breast, feeding, a, nursing a newborn baby. El Shaddai has the depiction of this. That's one reason a male and female are so attracted to each other, the complementary halves, because they want to complete what got pulled apart in the creation process. Now, let's go to, if we go to Genesis chapter 2, we find God created Adam. It doesn't say capital A, Adam. What I'm about to tell you, some of your translations will have footnotes, and it covers what I'm about to say to you right now. When God created humanity, he created Adam, small a. Don't think capital A, Adam the male. Our traditional view, male, rib, female. Now, it looks like that, but let's go into the Hebrew text. It's much more exciting and spiritually potent than that. He created Adam, humanity. When he created humanity, it's the only time he looked at humanity, what, what he created and said, this is not good. Every other time he creates them, it's good, it's good, that's good, that's good, that's good, that's good, that's good. And he created Adam and said, that's not good. Why would he say that about what he had just created? Because they didn't have the capacity for a relationship. It was one entity. He was created with a capacity of that, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. But he had created something that had no capacity. He says it's as one. It's not good. So at that point, he pulled apart. It wasn't a rib. That word is sela. It's almost like... The, 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 the car Tesla, the letters are reversed a little bit. Sela, silent T. Sela, which is used 40 times in the Tanakh, your Old Testament. And all those other times it's translated half or side. Here it's wrongly translated in most Bibles, rib. But look at your footnotes and you'll see what I'm saying. And so he created Adam and said, oh, that's not good. No capacity of relationship. So he removed a half or side, not rib, side or half. Now we have femininity, and now we have masculinity, which again is, is called the splitting of the atom, jokingly. It's why the hunger to go back together, the desire to come back together, because Adam, humanity, got split apart in the creation process. Let's look at the Hebrew words here if we can. Look at the word Hebrew, as you know, you read from right to left. So Aleph Yod Shin is man. Aleph, Sheen, Hey is the word for woman, Isha. Uh, we've heard the old joke, I'm sure you've heard it many times, that, that Adam took one look at Eve and he went, whoa, man, and it stuck, woman. Uh, Eve, Eve looked at Adam and went, ish, and it stuck, I guess. So that's where we, anyway, so you read from right to left, and you'll notice right away there's one letter in the top line that's not in the second line, and it's yod, like our Y. There's one letter in the second line that's not in the first line, that's hey, kind of like our, kind of like our H. Yod, hey. Those two words form the rudimentary form of yod, hey, vav, hey, the name for a Lord or God. And so stamped even on the name of man and woman is a name of God, two men, can't do that. Two women don't do that. Let's take another look at it right here. Now we'll see where we'll take the yod from man, bring it down to the, and put it in a little box, take the hay that's on the left, bring it down and put it in a box, yod hay, vav hay. Now you see the word for Yahweh. The two letters coming out of man and woman, the rudimentary letters of, of, of a word, the word Yahweh, is, is 6,800 times in your Hebrew Bible. Now let's go a little further, and here's a quick review of it. The one, name, one of the names for God, yod Hey. We drop it down, put it in man, drop it down, the Hey, and put it in woman. You read from right to left, remember. Now if you remove, if you remove Yod from man and Hey from woman, remove the image of God, 
And all you have is now two letters that indicate the word for fire. Let me ask you a question. Is fire good or bad? Well, it depends. Fire's bad if it's out of control. We have a fire burning in California right now, burning tens of thousands of acres. We had a fire in 2003, came through San Diego, took out 2,800 homes in four days. In 2007, we had one that took out 1,600 homes in about the same length of time. So fire out of control is a very bad thing. But fire under control is good. It's running this PA system. It's running the air conditioners. It's running the lights. It got you here in your car. It cooked your breakfast. It'll fix your lunch. Fire controlled is a good thing. So there's a fire, an attraction between a man and a woman. That fire is good and godly. That attraction, that desire for physical intimacy is a righteous act if it's in the constructs control of a covenantal marriage. Outside of that, it becomes not love but lust and is unbelievably destructive to the parties involved and everybody around them. Let's go to the next slide. Now we're gonna look at just a quick review. At the top is woman, Isha. You see the blue ending with the hay. Man, you see the green middle letter, Yod. We're seeing the next word, we see the green and the blue put together with the rest of Yahweh. Vav hey yod hey, and so now the way for Yahweh or God, and then we've already talked about fire, the two letters. If you take God out of man and you have just the fire by itself, you see the two letters right there. Now, I'm gonna walk you to the next step here. This is the word for covenant, Brit, berit, berit. If you think of British-ish man, Brit, a covenant man, what that comes from, but think of the word covenant, berit. Think of the covenant of marriage. It's not like a contract you sign and you can cancel at some point. A covenant is like forever. And so here's berit, the covenant. Now I want you to see what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna take the first two letters on the left. Remember we read from right to left. And I'm gonna, I mean, on the right I mean. And I'm gonna move those aside. I'm gonna take the letters on the left and move them aside and create a gap in the middle. This next slide. And I'm gonna insert the word for fire, and watch what happens. Now we have the word bereshit. What is bereshit? Bereshit is the first word in your Bible. It translates in the beginning. The Jews don't call Genesis Genesis, they call it bereshit. This was taught to me, what I'm telling you was taught to me by three Jewish rabbis. Victor, you'll love this. I was at Kufi in D.C. I didn't get there enough time. I had to stand in a long line for the final banquet, and I was grumbling about it, but I happened to meet a man who you know well, Pesach Wallachi, and he was right behind me or in front of me, I think it was, and this long line, and he taught me what I'm telling it as I was in that line, and when the line was finally done, I so wanted the line to keep going because I was drinking, and I, did, I was so disappointed the line wasn't longer because he was teaching me this, and he said to me, Jim, in the very beginning opening of the Bible, marriage is so sacred to God that he is in the first word of it, referred to that age, the fire that draws a man to a woman to cause them to want to complete what was split apart, Adam split apart. In the context of the covenant of marriage, this is profoundly sacred to the heart of God. He tucked it into the opening word of the Bible. Now, why have I talked to you about that? Because around the globe, there is the desire to destroy the image of God. It may be through divorce, it may be through pornography, it, it might be through transgenderism, all these vicious attacks on marriage. Why? How could you account for something so special? A man, a woman getting married, having babies. <clears throat> why would that be attacked over the entire globe? The, 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 what the, in God's lineup of things, the first thing he established was gender specificity, Genesis 1. The second thing was marriage. By Genesis 4, we have procreation. So the enemy is coming in in reverse order, killing the babies first, destroying the definition of marriage second, and then destroying male and, and female specificity third. This is a demonic move globally, you have to understand. This is not some political thing. This is, it has implications for the politics, but that those who are advocating the destruction of marriage 
by transgenderism, homosexuality, etc., are used by the evil one on a global basis. There's no country. This is not happening. It is a tough battle in many places to destroy the image of God. Wow. Now, let me take you further. We've got to wrap this up. Let me jump from, I'm going to do this one really short. Genesis to Revelation. The book starts with a marriage of a man and a woman. The book ends with a wedding of a bride and a groom. Revelation. Now, as we go over the flyover territory, Matthew 19, Jesus says, for this reason, a man will leave and the two will become one flesh. And then he says, what God has established, don't let any Supreme Court or Congress mess with. Now, that's a loose paraphrase. That's a garlo paraphrase of it. But now we're in Revelation. Now, we tend to think, here's what we, we tend to think, that God, when he described the end of time, how does he, what's the consummation of history? Consummation of all of history is going to be the marriage supper of the Lamb. We're getting ready for a huge wedding. This is a massive wedding. It's really astounding. It's, it's, God only has one kid. And so who marries his kid? He really cares about. He wants a bride that's spotless. Okay, you get the picture. So he's preparing that bride. So we're, now we go to the in, in, end of all of history. And so it's the marriage supper of the Lamb about to take place. So Paul goes to write in Ephesians 5 about this. He says, husband be this way, wife be this way, husband treat your wife, wife respond to your husband this way. And he says, I think you probably all think I'm talking about husbands and wives on earth. He says, no, I'm talking about a mystery. This is the mystery of the marriage of Christ and the people of God coming together. See, we tend to think this way, that God looked down and said, hmm, how shall I describe the closure of history? Let's see, all of history is going towards the marriage of my boy. So they all understand marriage. So I'm going to borrow their institution of marriage and use it for a metaphor. That's exactly wrong. It's the other way around. God invented capital M marriage as the closure of history. You've never seen real marriage yet. You've only seen the appetizer course or the hors d'oeuvres to what's the closure. You've seen small M marriage. When a husband and wife gets married, that is, think of, think of the best marriage you can. I hope it's your own. And, and, and think of the best marriage you can, that is to be a representation of the closure of history because Paul says, we can't understand Jesus and the church coming in. How does that work? I can't understand that. But I can look at you, married couples, husband and wife. Oh, oh, I look at Victor and Marie. I say, okay, it's something like that. Whatever that is, I, I can understand that. So it's something like that, that grand closure of history. And so we come to the closure of history. And here is this marriage supper of the Lamb taking place. And even think about this. Even the language we use to describe it are his marital bed language. We call it the consummation of history. We call it the climax of history. I indicated to you I'd written two books on heaven and the afterlife. One year ago, right now, uh, September 9th, my, my mother died a year ago, right now, September 9th. She was 102. She lived by herself, took care of herself. But at nine, she, she died on September 9th. They rushed her, the, 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 the ambulance took her, but she came back up. And we said, well, what, what happened? She actually then physically died again permanently on September 14th. So I got with her. I flew home because I, I was gone. I said, Mom, what happened? She says, well, I'll tell you when I can. Mom, I want to know what happened. She says, oh, it was, amazing. it was special. So finally, she talked to me after 24 hours. She says, I went to heaven. I saw it. I looked down and I saw my body. I, I, was, I was dead. Josie, that's my, my, my daughter, was saying, Grandma, Grandma. So the doctor at urgent care was saying, Winifred, Winifred. They were trying to save me. I didn't want to come back. I was so mad they brought me back. I said, I was, it was unbelievable. It says, heaven, my pain was gone. I had the body I had in high school. I saw the gates. And she started quoting Revelation. I saw the, the curtain. Oh, I saw the gates. And then she says, oh, my goodness, I think I'm dying. She says, and there was her next line. She says, if this is dying, this is fun. <laughs> I recorded her eight different times those next five days. We put it together, and, and we played it at her funeral. She preached her own funeral wow. about heaven, uh, heaven for that. I have people say to me, since I've written books on heaven, they'll say, well, do you, why is there no marriage in heaven? I said, are you kidding me? Heaven is a marriage. That's the whole deal is a big marriage taking place. They say, well, why is there no, for example, no sexual relations in heaven that we know of? I said, let me tell you, God gave the ecstasy and the joy of physical intimacy of a man and a woman coming together within covenant marriage. He gave that unbelievable joy and delight of that moment as a physical representation of the spiritual reality of being 
the ecstasy and the joy of being in the presence of Jesus. I've interviewed so many people in that book on heaven and the afterlife. <clears throat> My co-author and I, we interviewed these people and they would describe the joy and the delight. And they would say, every blade of grass was lit up and the music and every leaf in the tree with music was coming. It was, so I began to run, I ran effortlessly. It was breathtaking. Everybody who went did not want to come back except one lady who died in childbirth and she's like, I gotta go back for my baby. So she did. Not one of the people who died and crossed over had any fear of death from that point on. If I was Satan, what I would do is I would destroy the image of God, the Imago Dei, in Genesis, and I would destroy the picture of the marriage of the church and, and, and Jesus in Revelation. And that's why the enemy is destroying marriage cosmically of the whole globe. It's a demonic attack upon the nations of the earth. There's two things he's trying to destroy. Destroy anything to do with God and destroy any love for Israel. And that's why I've given you this glimpse of the sheep nations and the goat nations around the globe. Our God and our Father, we come to you as a people in need of you. Thank you for the privilege of gathering like this and our hearts being prepared for that grand day. We don't know how soon it is, but well, Lord, it sure feels like it could be soon. And so, Lord, we just say we want to be with you. We love you. We thank you for the privilege of being called by your name, the joy. We've never lost the joy of our salvation. Father, thank you for sending your, your son, your only kid, to die on the cross for our sins. And thank you for your Holy Spirit that comes to transform us and cause us to be able to walk in the power of what you have ordained for us to enjoy in you. And Lord, we pray for our unbelieving neighbors or those in our family to come to know you and know your people, the Jewish people, and fall in love with your nation, the nation of Israel, in preparation for what we'll enjoy with you forever. In the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, I pray, amen. Thank you for the privilege of being with you. I hope you've enjoyed uh, this morning's Prophecy Files Conference. Look for it, God willing, next year if the Lord hasn't already come. Other than that, I'll close with this statement that I say on every radio, television program and this. Remember this, Jesus Christ is coming soon. <laughs>